Regular monthly meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education, Monday, February 11th, 2019, 7 p.m. at Downers Grove Village Hall. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi is absent. Member Harris. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Member Miller. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Siegel. Here. Member Purcell. Here. Uh, tonight we'll start with the flag salute and El Sierra School with Principal Jason Lind. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, school board and community. We're very excited to represent El Sierra School tonight. We have not only our student council, we also have our PTA here tonight. Um, so we're going to start off with our PTA I'm sorry, we'll start off with our student council members. They're very excited to be able to tell us about the great things we have going on in El Sierra from the student council side. We have Ella, we have uh, uh, Becca, we have uh, Joe, and we also have Lauren. They're going to be um, telling us all about the great things in El Sierra. El Sierra Student Council has done a lot of good work for the school this year. Each year, it all begins with an election. Interested students choose a position to run for and write a speech explaining why they would do a good job in that position. Two students are then chosen to officially run for each of the four positions. Candidates choose a campaign manager and then get to work for the next week getting the word out about candidates. Campaign week ends with an assembly for the third through sixth graders. The campaign managers introduce their candidates and then each candidate gives a speech. There was some real tough competition this year. The students then all vote for their choice. We also tried something new this year and used Google Forms for our vote. We think it went well. Student Council loves organizing spirit days for LCA. We have enjoyed Crazy Happy Hair Day, Crazy Soft Day, Jam Day, and Rainbow Day. We are looking forward to having support your school day, Mismatch Day, Inside Out Day, Different Shoe Day, and Mission Day. Fridays at Elsera are Bobcat Days. Students show their school spirit by wearing blue and yellow on Bobcat colors. The class that has no spirit and is a Bobcat flag for the week. Giving back to the community is very important to us. This year we had hats for Hurricane Florence Day. Everyone donated money to wear their favorite hat all day. All of the money earned was donated to the Red Cross to support the victims of Hurricane Florence. Our yearly Thanksgiving food drive was a huge success. We collected boxes of food that were donated to the Downers Grove Fish Pantry. In December, we decorated our trees with new hats, mittens, and scarves that we donated to the Family Shelter Services. We held El Sierra's Super Bowl this month. Students brought in cans of soup and placed them in the bins for the team that they wanted to win the big game. All cans were donated to the Downers Grove Fish Pantry. Another priority of Student Council is to raise funds for various needs at El Sierra. This year, we will we decided to sell holiday snow soaps during lunchtime in the month of December. They were a big hit amongst the kids. Kids seemed to enjoy coming up to the table and smelling all the scents before choosing their favorite. We also planned to have a school store, which has been named the Bobcat Boutique. We set up shop during lunchtime and sell Bobcat themed school supplies to the other students. This is a great way we show our school spirit. In past years, Student Council has funded things such as New Gymnastics Math, the curtain for the stage, and the Gaga Pit, with help from the PTA and the Lester family. We are still deciding on our plans for this year, but one of our thoughts is to help fund a water well in Africa. One of the highlights of this year is the variety show. Students truly enjoy showing off their talents at this exciting event. The Student Council officers have the privilege of emceeing the event and keeping the excitement levels high. Program for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students. We volunteered to help kindergarten, first, and second graders organize and play games at lunch recess every day. The primary students love seeing and interacting with the intermediate students outside. This program gives our older students a chance to lead by example and keep our playground safe. At the beginning of the school year, our sixth graders become experts on specific recess games. They then take what they have learned and present it to each grade, grade level and practice playing it. The sixth graders model good sportsmanship and 
Explain all the rules. This helps to keep recess fun, exciting, and safe all year round. School board members, thank you for taking the time to hear about all the wonderful things our student council is doing at LCR. We are very proud to be back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have a we have a gift for the student council as well. Thank you. You did a good job.
I am Dara Toscano. Um, moving right along, all the students at every school love the room parties, and it's definitely one of the big hits throughout the year. So the PTA plans these um, um, parties for the rooms with the help of the room parents, and they have fun party games for every classroom. The focus there is to always have games that have small groups. Um, where they can enjoy along with creative ways to serve fresh fruits and vegetables. Students always look forward to these parties. It's a huge high level excitement time. Field trips, one of the things that ETA has really tried to focus on is helping out with as many field trips as we can. Um, so we continually try to provide additional ones. New this year, the LCR ETA is providing the funds for our fourth, fifth, and sixth graders to experience Feed My Starving Children. Um, so this way they can also make a difference in the lives of those less fortunate. We also try to strive to help out with as many educational programs within the school as possible. Um, the highlight this year was Pebble Go, which is an online library research tool. The students so far this year have been able to use Pebble Go to work on their bi biography research. Um, the program has really helped our educators engage the children in doing creative ways of learning. And then the ever popular Breakfast with Santa. Um, this is an annual thing that we have at the school. It's for families. It's um, completely 100% um, involved with both the students and their parents, and grandparents, aunts, uncles, whoever they can bring. The kids love the food. Um, the students love all the games and face painting and crafts, and, and everybody loves Santa. Another event, at, um, favorite event, at Breakfast with Santa is the story time with reading of the Polar Express. Um, in addition to Breakfast with Santa, <clears throat> the LCR PTA brought families together uh, this past weekend for our annual Valentine's Day party, which we weren't able to get on. <laughs> our PTA book fairs um, are a great, great reading tool that we have throughout um, the, the school year. We have two of them usually per year. LCR PTA loves to promote reading. Each year we have the two book fairs and encourage students to earn free Kane County Cougars tickets by reading lots of books. Um, to participate in the program, 100 additional minutes of reading per week for eight weeks earns each student a free ticket to the game, a free drink, a hot dog, and a golden ticket entitling them to complimentary admission to all June through September games and reading club suit. Um, the book fairs also help to provide a wish list for the teachers in the school. This year, the book fair sales were able to provide classrooms with wish list books of over $500, and then the LRC received over $400 worth of books. And we just wanted to thank you for allowing us to come out and show you a glimpse of <coughs> what the Student Council and the LCRPT are doing. Um, we're looking forward to continuing to build um, our school as a community and do as much as we possibly can to finish up this year's job. Thank you for that presentation and for all your hard work uh, for El Sierra. Thank you. Uh, thank you. One more thing. We uh, wanted to be able to just promote a little bit of some of the neat things that are going on at our school. Last year we came up with, um, as a staff, we really worked hard to create a vision statement. Um, so we're going to show that video in just a second. Uh, but before that, I want to just highlight some of the great things that we have going on at El Sierra. Um, beyond student council and PTA. And one of the things this year um, that we wanted to really stress was the fact that our students are really growing academically. We've been seeing that for a number of years um, with the MAP tests, but this year really with uh, Park factoring in uh, academic growth and student growth um, really helped us to be uh, where we're at right now um, with our ranking as an exemplary school. We're very proud of that. Um, we still have you know, a lot of work ahead of us, but just like every school, but we're very proud to be able to see that growth that our students have. Uh, one of the things that we're extremely proud of is our parent partnership uh, that we've been really focusing on these last couple of years. Um, this year, all of our staff members are working hard with the Seesaw app, and our students are finding a lot more creative ways to be able to um, express what they're doing with their families compared to just the teacher saying that this is what we're doing. And some of those authentic pieces have been great to be able to see um, throughout the course of the year. I know we're gonna be looking at that 
a little bit later as well as, this, as a district. Um, we're also very proud of our small group instructional model. That's one of the things we've been doing at LCR for a number of years. Um, we have a wide variety of needs, just like every school, um, but when we can work in those small groups, we can really meet the students where they're at and help them to achieve uh, more and more um, every year. Um, you know, it's not all sunshine and roses at every school, and just like at us here, we do have some challenges too. One of the things that we are constantly taking a look at is our enrollment. Um, that's one of the things that I know you as a school board take a look at as well. Um, with us being the smallest school in the district number-wise in terms of students, it does create some challenges for us as we start to make some of those instructional decisions, we being me. <laughs> um, and some of those decisions come down to, um, you know, are we going to have one large section in a grade? Are we going to have two small ones because we're going to have one large one? Are we going to have combination classes with multi-grades? Um, some of those types of things we don't always know in the spring because our enrollment changes all the way up until school starts and then sometimes even after Labor Day. So. Um, that's why I'm kind of pulling my ear right here. Um, but it is one of those things where, you know, we want to do what's best for kids, um, but also include our families along in that process. Um, and that's one of the things in the last couple of years, we've been having a few more parent forums to let them know that these are some of our options as we get closer to the school year starting. Um, other things that, you know, we, we have to make decisions around with some of those um, one class you know, being one grade level, being one teacher, or having combination classes and things like that, is sometimes our teachers are being asked to teach, you know, multiple math blueprints some years and things like that, which um, you know, is one of those things that um, we do put into a lot of thought. Are there ways that we can um, help with teachers in those situations? Are there ways that we can support students? But it really comes down to meeting students where they're at and helping them grow. Um, we're also very proud of our. Um, you know, when we talk about the number of families that we have in our community, how many of them come out to our events. Um, and I think a lot of that is focused on uh, be, truly being a family event to celebrate the great things that we have at our school compared to just coming in raising money. Uh, while that's an important aspect, we do want to um, really honor the fact that we want to have a, a few more community celebrations. The last few years we've started having an international night. Um, and this year, um, through the help of uh, a grant, we're going to be having a uh, math our first math night of the year. Um, so that's going to be exciting to have. And then one of the big things for us is we're going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary um, at El Sierra. So that's an exciting thing for us as we start to welcome back some of our alumni and other community members. Um, our neighborhood has a lot of empty nesters, so it's going to be kind of nice to say, hey, remember when your children were here, you know, within the last 50 years, come back and take a look at our school. We're very proud of what we have to offer at El Sierra. Um, so now if we could just take a second to take a look at our vision statement video that we have. The reason why we created this was so that people who aren't familiar with an open concept can kind of get a little bit of a glimpse into our school, but also see that it might not look too different than the classrooms that maybe you grew up with, even if you're not familiar with an open concept. But as you look around, look at the words, but then also look at um, everything in the picture because there's a lot that you can see just by taking a look at this video. So we appreciate your time. of the audience will have the opportunity to provide public comment to the board during the reception of visitors later on the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table to my right. <clears throat> they will be used to assist us in allocating time so that all those who wish to have the opportunity to speak and help us follow up after the meeting. Tonight, the board plans to allocate 30 minutes to public comment. Please fill out a card if you wish to speak. The board will also ask each person to plan to speak for no more than three minutes so that all have the opportunity to comment. We invite those who have submitted cards to speak first. If time allows, others will have the opportunity to address the board. 
So next we'll go to the non-action reports. Uh, first, we'd like to recognize some students. Uh, that we, the board would like to formally recognize students. Uh, over 500 students who participated in the 2018-19 Science Fair on February 2nd at O'Neill. Congratulations on your hard work and accomplishments, and thank you to the faculty, staff, and community members who volunteered to make this a successful learning event. Uh, next on our agenda is the spotlight on our schools, uh, parent partnerships and learning with Jane Uzentis and James Eichmiller. Thank you. Um, we wanted to spend a little bit of time tonight, I apologize, I'm struggling with a cold, um, sharing information with the board about our work around parent partnerships and learning and some of the activities that we have begun plus the exciting work ahead. So if you recall, the, the goal on parent partnerships was actually part of our prior strategic plan and really look, taking a look at parent partnerships in learning looking at the ways that we can improve, strengthen our partnerships, more outreach to parents. Let's reflect on how we can support student learning through this partnership. We have since then incorporated our new strategic plan and there's definitely crossover from both of the plans. I have on this slide I wanted to highlight the objectives, the 2.1, 2.2, those objectives in our new strategic plan are really at this point in their initial stages of the work with our um, Community Advisory Council and looking at the district-wide activities. Tonight we're talking more about the specifics at our building level and looking at those partnerships and how we're building those relationships specific to the building. Um, in the objective 2.3, the consistency objective, there is a specific bullet. We've just now begun the work with our looking at the communications to our communities from the individual buildings and trying to work toward that increased communication as well as consistency. And so a small group of administrators along with myself and James have begun to look at what are some of the ideas that we are already using, what's in place now, and then our plan would be to continue working through this year to put something in place for the start of next year so there is more consistency in that communication that comes from the building principal specifically to our schools, to our parents. Another piece of our presentation tonight is sharing um, the survey information. We did a very brief survey during the parent conference week and we were pleased to have there were 642 responses. These next two slides really just give a general picture, if you will, of um, our parents, where the value is in some of these activities, in our communication, again, specific to academic progress with their child. And so if you notice nothing, um, actually there's not really any alarming or shocking information. When we did the survey three years ago, we had very similar results in that our parents value, looking at the, the parents who rated a four and a five, the report card as a communication tool, classroom assessments, and then you'll see it the next level there that MAP scores are important. Um, park scores and rubrics were less valuable to our parents. And then you'll notice parent-teacher conferences continues to be uh, one of our structures and systems that parents find very valuable, as well as student work samples. And then you know, lesser value on the standards-based reporting information, percentage-based reporting. And so this was just giving us that sense of where do parents value and how much value is there in each of these um, methods of communication. The next slide, this is really for those people that want to see the actual numbers of, and we've, rate, we've ordered them, so really the value looking at the parents who um, aren't most valuable, the five or the four, the highest value is with our parent-teacher conference um, activity, which we were happy to see because we did make changes in the structure of conferences. Student work samples still high, report cards then in classroom assessments. Then you'll look at the MAP scores in student assessment and then it tapers off a little bit. So just sharing this information so you can get a sense of you know, where that value is. And then finally related to the survey, we wanted to highlight three of the questions and I wanted to share some general themes in the open-ended portion. Um, first, because we had made the change in conferences, we wanted to know, do our parents 
feel the information they gained was valuable. We are happy with the 90%. Um, the information absolutely, though, tells us, let's take a look at that other 10%. Are there ways that we can continue to improve the parent-teacher parent, con parent conference experience so more parents find it a valuable experience? That second question was geared more toward the formative conference, the midterm conference we have now. Because if you recall, our reason and purpose for making that change was we want to partner with parents earlier in the learning process. We want parents to have the opportunity to learn more about where their child is progressing, what are those areas, so they can work and be part of the learning process prior to the end of a reporting period. Um, so again, 89% of our parents feel they did receive information that allowed them to support their child prior to the end of the marking period. Again, area for growth, absolutely. We can continue to try to increase that percentage so more parents feel that they have that opportunity to be actively involved throughout. And then finally, that third question was, as we have changed, we, if you recall, we had conferences were two evenings twice a year. We had one year, a couple years ago, we had a full day conference. In addition to evenings, we really didn't um, get large parent participation during that full day. It didn't seem to fit with our parent schedules necessarily, perhaps. This year we have the half day during the day, plus the evenings. Um, we want to get a sense of, our parents able to attend, which we were happy that 84% of our parents, that 538 parents, yes, were able to attend. Of those parents who aren't, are they still able to get that important information about their child? And so this would be our area to look more closely at, you know, 78, 78 of the parents who couldn't come to conferences said yes, 22 said no. So maybe there's an opportunity there of how can we put more systems in place to make sure there's more outreach so parents do feel they have that opportunity to gain that information and partner with our schools. The bullets, as you look in the open again, the, the last question was you know, sh basically share anything you would want us to consider or know more about conferences. These are general themes. Um, 160 parents did respond. It was primarily very positive about loving the opportunity. Um, the, the pieces that came up a couple times, more than a couple times, or consider the length of the conferences. I think that's a, a common response of it's just not long enough. Could we consider 20 minute conferences in the spring as opposed to 15? Um, interestingly, that very same piece of feedback came from our teachers of it doesn't seem long enough, can we look at this? We do want to continue looking at the, that option of making a change there, possibly. The second bullet, again, was came from parents, but it also came from our teaching staff is as we think about that January conference, it came pretty quickly right after Christmas, and that winter break period, could we consider a little bit more time, a little later in January, when we would have map data for the grades, the, the grade levels that are taking map, and also teachers would have more time to analyze the information, to make plans and be able to talk to parents about, here's where your child is, here's the progress, and here's what we wanna do as next steps. And so that, it was nice to see that came from both our parents and our teachers, you know, asking, hey, can we look at that a little closer as we plan for next year? The other um, bullets, just again, parents sharing the things they thought were valuable. And it's that, that third bullet was around the keeping the schedule so that we can stay on time with our conferences and encouraging more meetings that if they're not gonna fit within the conference time to schedule additional meetings. Parents, multiple parents shared how much they appreciated having student work samples because it really gave them a much better picture of the strengths or any areas of concern. And then that final bullet, again, are conversations we have had as well with staff is looking at that middle school conference structure. We don't have a good answer for that right now, but that definitely has been a question of that 10 minutes seems real tight. We can't get to all of our teachers. Isn't there a better way we can organize this? So I, I think you will, from my perspective, we'll be looking at conversations, not for next year, but let's try to try to brainstorm our, is there a different way maybe we should be organizing and scheduling the middle school conferences for both parents and teachers. As we shift into the partnership activities across the school level, the three main um, topics or 
activities on this page. We've talked about the conferences. Again, the purpose was to try to involve parents in that learning process early so they can partner throughout the year. The second bullet related to Seesaw, James and um, we have some staff who will be talking a little bit more. We began initial exploration and implementation of Seesaw with the end goal, it's not, not where we are right now, it's not where we will be maybe next year, but our end goal ultimately is to be able to use that tool to provide specific information related to the child's learning experience and their progress in learning. We're so very specific to the child, so as a parent, you have a good sense of your, your child's learning in the program. And then the third bullet um, relates to power, power School and the Parent Portal. Uh, our parents right now at the middle school are able to go into the Parent Portal, look at specific information related to the learning experiences. Um, some of our teachers, you may know, have begun exploring Google Classroom. And it was interesting, I was at a um, principal council, which is a, the principal and a group of students meeting, talking about the things that, they, that the kids liked about communication within the school and the things they felt were useful. And Google Classroom continued to come up as a very helpful tool that some of our kids are getting to use and, and benefit from, as well as parents. So I think there'll be more conversations that will tie right into our strengthening our partnerships around Google Classroom in the future as well. Oops, sorry about that. At this point, I would like to introduce Michelle Zepka, principal of Hillcrest School. Let's talk a little bit more about our partnerships. Sorry, sure. Hello. Um, so just a couple more specific examples of things that we're doing at the building level um, to involve and really integrate the parent group. Um, we're going to switch over to, um, this is one example of a newsletter that I send out weekly to the Hillcrest community, um, sharing with them, um, it's really a balance of information and explanation along with highlighting some of the things that we are most proud of. Um, I typically start out, um, um, the opening paragraph, just to sort of hook our readers in, um, anything important here that maybe those who aren't going to read through the whole thing, in this case, just emphasizing um, where we're at in terms of the benchmark assessment, um, a lot of times parents know that it's coming, but they don't necessarily know how long it's going to last. So I just made a statement in the beginning to say, well underway, finishing up in the middle of next week. Um, and then I really try to highlight um, some of the great things that we're doing within our classroom. This specific example um, shows some pictures and then highlights one of the um, parent partnership activities that we did within a third grade classroom where they were invited in to dissect owl pellets. Um, which is really cool if you haven't experienced it. Um, I think it's also a really great opportunity for some of the uh, parents at, who have younger students to see sort of the things that are coming um, in future years. Um, we highlight every month um, at our all school meetings, we talk about a specific focus, uh, character trait or focus topic. In this case, it was communicating out what happened at that all-school meeting and making sure that parents have some of that common vocabulary and are familiar with what we are emphasizing with students in terms of um, the focus rate of courage and the power of yet. Um, we talked through flexible versus stuck thinking. So again, I know that I've received feedback from some parents who are saying, thank you for sharing the exact vocabulary that you're using. I'm also trying to incorporate that at home. Um, we, of course, want to highlight and take pride in recognizing these are our Hound Dogs of the Month, um, along with our Possum Staff Award winners. We have the Cleanest Cubby Award, especially <laughs> this time of year. Um, and then uh, this newsletter was um, back in December when PTA Reflections was happening, so recognizing students who participated in that. 
And then it's also a way to give some reminders, an upcoming music performance, or the science fair registration. Um, Megan Hewitt and I kind of work hand in hand, and I borrow some of her information, she borrows some of mine. Um, and then we always, or I always incorporate, um, we work very closely with our PTA, so we want to make sure that we're both tag teaming, getting the message out there on what some of the initiatives are, um, up and coming. Uh, and then I know that along with all of this information, which looks a little lengthy, but parents really appreciate just getting a rundown. Um, I usually try to map out the rest of the month. Um, and I know a lot of the parents have shared that, you know, as soon as that comes out, they get out the calendar. And this is, serves as a nice reminder, too, um, to just keep everybody on track. So that's just one example. Um, many of our building leaders obviously use different forms of weekly communications. They might look a little different, but we all try to highlight many of the things that we're doing um, within the building to keep parents in the know. Um, a lot of schools will use parent uh, or positive parent contacts, whether it's via email or just a phone call. Um, preschool uses a daily communication log so that each one of their students who maybe don't, they don't have the verbal skills to articulate what's happening at school each day, but they're able to then um, the parent can ask some more specific questions tied to what's happening at um, school. You um, also probably have been invited into your child's classroom or to the school for whether it's a math night or a STEM night, um, kindergarten roundup, or a cultural arts or uh, fair or night. And then just to continue in terms of parent involvement opportunities, I know we mentioned <coughs> watchdogs with El Sierra. There's lots of opportunities, whether it's guest readers or mystery readers, Park Vision Art or Art Appreciation, I think we all have different names but are really <coughs> trying to do the same thing, which is collaborate with our families um, in one way, shape, or the other. <laughs> pass it over to James, who's going to highlight some more. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, so, so CISA is a tool that I know that we've been hearing a lot about over the past couple of years, and it's just a tool that we continue to be uh, really excited about, uh, in particular in the way that it's going to allow us to partner with parents. Uh, all the good things you've seen and heard about CISA, it's, it's worth noting, kind of as Jane mentioned, that we're not even yet fully implemented with CISA. Oh, and next year, we look forward to kind of being in that first year of full implementation where we're, we're asking all uh, pre-K through sixth grade teachers to, to use CISA as a, as a way to uh, document student learning and then share those artifacts with parents. So we're really excited about that in particular because I, I can tell you it's feedback that, that I've heard for many years, pretty much you know, my entire time here in Downers Grove, that it is really challenging as a parent to have so many different tools to have to, to you know, for one grade level and for one school and for this child and for that child to have to track down where to find information about your child. Uh, I'm not going to say that that problem will be solved next year, but we do hope that Seesaw at the pre-K through sixth grade level will be a central spot that all parents will know. They can go sign in, create an account, link with their students, and really get that direct line into what their students are doing, uh, what they're doing at school during the school day. Uh, so also along the lines with what Jane mentioned is that you know, next year will be our first year of full implementation, but, but it will be a work in progress. Uh, you know, now that we're getting everyone there, uh, we can continue to have conversations about how CISA is being used and why it's valuable to document learning and to use as an assessment tool and a communication tool. So you know, look for us to continue to try to improve that, but we view it as a, a really essential part of our way to partner with parents and how we're communicating what's happening in the classroom. So, uh, with that being said, I've uh, invited a few guests here tonight to speak a little bit about uh, how they're using Seesaw and how they're seeing Seesaw. And so we're going to start with Jason Lind, who you saw uh, earlier tonight speaking in his capacity as a principal of El Sierra School. Uh, here is actually going to be kind of shifting a little bit and talking about his pers perspective, excuse me, his perspective as a parent at Fairmont. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> This first one here is my youngest son, Nathan, and um, he's one of those little guys who would rather have somebody to read to him than to read out loud himself. So it's kind of been one of those things where, as an educator myself, it's like, I know he can read, but he wants somebody else to read to him all the time. So it's been neat for me to be able to see, he's in second grade right now, um, the big growth he's making and reading progress, but just with this app for him to want to share with us through 
and what he's doing at school is meaning for us to be able to see as parents the, how much he's growing as reader, but then how much um, he feels more comfortable to do that rather than if we ask him, hey, did you read at school today? Yeah, <laughs> now we can actually hear what he's doing. So we'll just hear a little bit of a sample of it, um, but it's nice because he's able to have ownership of sending it to us. <laughs> My dragon wasn't feeling good. He had a dragon wasn't feeling good. He had a nasty chill. He couldn't keep shivering. I saw that he was ill. His eyes were red and watery. His nose were running too. His brain was nothing but a fizzle. So you can just kind of see. So all of a sudden you get a notification on your phone that says, you know, there's Nathan Holt with this, you know, so then whatever time you can find it and look at it and you get that and as a parent that conversation at dinner is a lot different than um, any other time without seesaw it wouldn't have been possible or as easy maybe yep the next what well, i actually have four children in the district we're not going to show you all of them. <laughs> <laughs> one more <coughs> this is my son everett he's in punishment right now i'm kidding he's, uh, he's in uh, gym class right now and he's one of those kids that you know tell you yeah i can do 100 push-ups without even you know trying but to see how much his teacher's making focus on his form. This is one of the things it was kind of neat to be able to see that he's working pretty hard to do them with correct form. So here we go. The <laughs> 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 part is, you know, with specials, you know, a lot of times as a parent, you know that they have them a few times a week. Um, and a lot of times, for him, he'll talk so much about the games they play, but to see that they're really focused on that fitness aspect and form and things like that. As a former coach myself, it's nice to be able to see that he's definitely alive and well in our district. And I see it in our school, anyone else here, obviously, because I have that new perspective. But to get that, we will have that conversation you know, about gym class a little bit different compared to why something wasn't fair. It's a lot more fun to be able to talk about progress. So, thank, you. thank you, Jason. I think a couple of things that, that I'd like to highlight from there. One is just the idea that I, that I always love to remind about CISO. I think students do the posting a, a lot of the times, not everything, but it really empowers them that they do something, work with their product, or they want to share with either their teacher or with their parent. Uh, they can grab their iPad and, and with a few clicks really quickly and simply post it. The other thing is that our PE teachers are able to use this. I, I, you know, PE, I mean, there's already so much going on in the space, and students have to bring their equipment. I think it, I think it speaks to the fact that. This tool is so easy to use that students can bring it into the PE class while well, everything else is going on and be able to uh, create artifacts like that. So I think it's very exciting. So thank you, Jason. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Sarah David, uh, who is our teacher at several schools in our district, to give uh, some more uh, specialist perspective. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah David. Um, I really found out that CESA allows my students to like create art and have their parents see what they're actually making on in art class. It allows students to be present and to present all of their stuff to their parents in a real-time audience, which we didn't have before. I have over a thousand students and that would be really hard for me to get everything across to parents because I just don't have time to talk to every parent. So this is a great way for kids to talk. This slide right here is a little slide of, and I'm not going to attempt to read it because my 40 year old old eyes will want to do that. But a student created a self portrait and then they talked about the history behind why we did this and how they did it, the process of creating. And then they also talked about what they would change and why they chose the colors they chose. It's all about the kids for me, that the kids get to reflect on what they're doing in my class. And I think that's really powerful for them to say, wow, I really did something cool and that's really fun and this is why I did it, Mom and Dad and Mrs. David, and this is what I learned about this artist and this is why we're doing what we're doing in class. So I don't do the posts the kids do. This is a sixth grade example. The next one is a fourth grade example. I also still focus on the history behind the art, the process of creating art, and their opinions of what they would change. This is a shoe drawing that one of my fourth grade did and you can see parents responded to it they love it when their parents respond sometimes they respond in class and as I'm approving things I see it come through and I'm like Joe you have a parent comment check your feed and then they get to see it which is fun the next one shows a kindergarten sample on the left where I put dot dot not a lot because they're practicing gluing 
which is a really big skill for kindergarten. So parents get to see some, a couple of kids in class gluing, and they get to use those terms and techniques with their kids at home. The one on the right side was a student picture. I'm working on the kids to take a picture above their art, put their art on the floor, and then take a picture above it. So they don't get like a crazy distorted view of their art, which is really important. And that was a weaving that a student made in um, first grade. And the parent commented too, which is really fun. Is it this one? Yeah. The last one is my kindergartners don't bring their iPads to art. So a lot of times I'll just sit with like two or three kids and get a picture of them with their art and then I let them talk about it. So the little kid would say something like, this is my shape party and we learned about cutting out different shapes. I hope you like it, you know, something like that. And it doesn't go to the whole class, it just goes to that specific child and their followers, their parents or their family. So that's really nice. It's something that I've not really had a good way of finding, a way to share everything and I've been looking for a really long time for a tool that doesn't, I don't want my kids reflecting on each other's art as per se in writing because that can sometimes hurt feelings. But I want the parents to be able to see what's going on in my class. And we've sparked so many cool conversations, even when we were out in the hall today. I posted a picture of the kids making masks, and one of the parents from El Sierra was like, that was the cutest picture ever, and then showed everybody in the hall. It's just such a nice way to just, the parents know me, they, they understand what goes on in my class. And so I've had a great time with Seesaw this year. So. Thank, Thank you so you. much for sharing. A, a, a thousand number student is really uh, a lot. It's, it's really striking when you think about it. And I, and I think the way that uh, Mrs. David is able to, 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 to get this out to parents and get that quickness and feedback is uh, it's pretty remarkable. So thank you so much. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Jenny Lahatsky, who is uh, a coach at a few of our schools. And we're going to play first. Oh, I'll stop a little bit. Uh, as an instructional coach, I have the opportunity to work with teachers across three different schools currently and to enhance instruction. And Seesaw has been able to add a powerful aspect to that to make that enhancement so much more powerful. In this example, we're going to see a first grade student comparing informational and narrative text. Have you been listening? <laughs> Talk about things in nature, nonfiction, as close to the options, has a table of contents, a lottery index, a body life cycle, real photos, book text, uses on and on the first, next, then last, or, or finally, and the fox and the rock. Illustrations features as a lesson, so too has captain's fiction. So here, not only was the student able to show the comparing and the contrasting of the two different texts, they were also to add, able to add their voice in to explain even more. So they were, all, like on a worksheet, they would only be able to put in so many pieces of information, but here you could see further the depth of their knowledge that they had that you wouldn't have been able to see on a piece of paper that would go home. So this not only gets sent to the parents, but it automatically goes to the teacher, and they're able to get that formative assessment feedback, and then the student is given that opportunity to reflect. So they're reflecting on the lesson, making sure they understand what they're doing, at, while the teacher is able to formatively assess them, and the parent is seeing all at the same time. So this is a really quick way of doing those three powerful things in the classroom. And then we're continuing to collaborate on these activities, and comparing and contrasting is a big skill throughout first grade and throughout most of the benchmark curriculum. So they're continuing to show growth throughout doing similar activities like this in a similar structure. It's been a very helpful. Thank you so much. Mrs. Hume sends her regrets. Uh, Mrs. Yes. She is a uh, graduate uh, course tonight, so she wasn't able to attend to share. So thank you so much for coming to share. So yeah, this is one of those things that, that I, I, I get really excited about, and, and I, I, I think luckily for you guys, there's not like 20 more slides, but I feel like there could be, because there's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's so many fantastic uh, examples of how our teachers uh, and students have really taken advantage of this tool this year. So I'm excited about more to come. And, uh, so I've just got a couple slides, uh, just with some some statistics, and this is from uh, November, kind of our our most recent complete month. Uh, and uh, so this just gives you a, a sense of how many posts are happening at each school. Uh, you know, Indian Trail and Puffer, Puffer, it's worth noting those two schools have um, preschool 
and they use CISA as a tool pretty extensively as part of their portfolio process. So that's why their numbers are in particularly high. Yes. But, but, but this just <laughs> gives you a... <laughs> yeah, those two, those, those two definitely stand out. But um, this gives you a sense of, of just the volume of how this tool is being used. Those are some pretty big numbers of posts getting added to CISA at each of those schools. If you think of you know, each school having you know, around 300 students, obviously. So, um, so anyways, it's, it's a pretty prolifically used tool. And again, we're not even quite to a, a point of full <coughs> implementation yet. And this is another post that, that has um, students in orange and family members uh, in blue. And, and so you'll see, I think probably the, the most interesting thing about this one is not necessarily looking at the difference between schools because those are tied to enrollment, but actually how tight those student and family members uh, connections are. So we have a lot of students on there and, and family members are also connecting as well. I, I think that's the important part of this. Not just something that's happening in school and you're putting it out there and we don't know whether or not parents are interacting, uh, but, but we have some data that really shows that parents are <coughs> connecting with these accounts and they are viewing these artifacts. So I, I think this is one of those things that I, I think we can be really proud of, that our parents uh, appreciate this tool and they're taking the time to download the app, to set up the account, and connect with their students because they really value seeing their children's work. I think that brings it to the end of our presentation. So we appreciate your time and, and for hearing about this, and uh, we do look forward to continuing our work in this area. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I, I do just have one quick question. Jane, you reflected a a lot on the parent survey information, and I know you mentioned anecdotally a couple places where the teachers and the parents were aligned. Were there any instances that stuck out to you where the teachers had strong um, feedback about the way the conferences worked or didn't work that, that we should be taking into account for next year? No, the, the teacher feedback, I, which I should have said, uh, was not through a, a survey. It was through our grade level meetings that we've had this last few weeks, and so we really spent time talk, just let people talk about how the conferences go. The, from the teacher perspective, the feedback that we have is all very, very positive. Um, they feel like the parent feedback that they received was also very positive, and just the, those conversations around sharing what ideas and what would you maybe try and change for next time. Okay. But I would say it's very consistent, very positive feedback from staff. Um, we just wrapped up our grade level meetings today uh, and, and talked to our teachers who at every grade level, we're happy to hear, yes, we're going into next year with this mid-trimester mid, um, conference format, and we'll continue to build upon that experience. Okay. So, it's consistent. Any other? Okay. Okay. Thank you, nice presentation, and thank you to the teachers who came out and uh, gave us the extra information as well and the, and the, and the uh, videos of your children. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next uh, on the agenda is a spotlight on our schools, uh, the fall 2018 school environment survey results uh, with Megan Hewitt. Hi. Good evening. Um, board members, I'm really excited to share with you the results from the recent um, school environment survey for parents. As you may recall, the um, former strategic plan here in District uh, 58 was approved in 2011, and one of the major goals back then was social-emotional learning. Um, and as part of that goal, uh, back in 2011, the district started a school environment survey. Um, it, originally, it was for parents and students. Um, in recent years, the state's five essential survey for students uh, replaced our school environment survey for students, uh, but we have continued throughout the year to offer parents a school environment survey. Um, this year, we administered it in November and December and offered it in English and Spanish. And while we didn't receive a record number of responses, we definitely received more responses than we typically do, um, which is great. We always, we always try to get as much parent feedback as possible. Um, so over 1,300 responses was pretty, um, pretty great for this year. Um, so I'm gonna be doing a quick review of some of the quantitative uh, data, um, both what we did, how we achieved this year, and then also comparing it to previous years. And then um, I'll be doing a deep dive into um, the open-ended questions uh, that we ask parents at the end of the survey. Uh, so just kind of to overview the 
format. Um, here's one of the statements from that survey. My child is cared for by the adults at school. Um, you can see that 96 percent of parents either um, say always or usually, which is fantastic, but almost um, just as important, 0% um, or I think technically 0.2% of parents said never, um, which is very important and really good to see. Um, and then if you look over at the historic data, um, over the past four years, each year we've improved one percentage point in this category. Um, and then going back to the baseline year, 2011, um, you see really significant growth, 83%. Um, um, though it's worth knowing, noting that in 2015, um, we had a small survey committee, um, and we changed the rating scale from one of agreement previously, um, it was strongly agree, agree, disagree, etc., cetera, um, to one of frequency to give us a little bit better information. Um, so we can't exactly compare the 2011 data apples to apples, but um, it's fairly sim similar. So I'll go through the rest of these quantitative um, results a little bit more quickly, but you can see with this question, my child is getting a quality education. Um, pretty good scores, pretty steady over the last four years. Does show some good improvement um, since 2011. Uh, looking at um, how supportive the school is for students, very similar to that first question where we see some steady growth each year in the past four years. And also how supportive and inviting the school is for parents. Um, we haven't seen as much growth in the past four years, but it's been fairly st uh, steady um, and still you know, in the 90%, which is pretty good as well. Um, then here, focusing specifically on social emotional skills, we see some huge improvements. Um, if you look at 2011, 73% um, of parents agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. Um, this year, 92% of parents say that their school always or usually um, focuses on it. And related to that, parent um, and guardian involvement with social emotional uh, learning skills, um, we've seen improvements we're at 90 percent now um, we were at 78 percent in 2011 parent feedback um, this question was not asked in 2011 um, but as you can see it's we've um, improved by six percentage points in just the last four years um, parent feedback was uh, something that came up um, in our during our strategic planning process last year and um, we formed a uh, council this past year, the Communications Feedback Council, that's really looking at um, not only ways we can improve the feedback we get from parents, but also improve what we do with that feedback as a school district. So going forward, um, there is continued room for growth with this question. As you can see, only 33% of parents said we always consider parent feedback, um, and that's something that I think we can improve upon and something that I hope um, I think some of our our current um, improvement measures will hopefully tackle this question uh, this statement focuses on student diversity and respect which is also directly linked to social emotional learning and you can see we've made tremendous growth um, just in the past four years we've improved five percentage points and then the last area for the quantitative section um, I want to focus on is teacher communication. Um, and this is shown, was not, this particular question was not asked in 2011, um, but we've seen some improvement over the past four years, um, though more steady the past two or three years. Um, and I know uh, with Seesaw, some of our uh, communications in um, our classrooms are continuing to improve. As, you saw in some of our last presentations. So at the end of the survey, we asked parents two open-ended questions. Um, the first one is, what is one thing District 58 uh, does well that we would like to, you would like us to continue? And the other one is, what can we improve upon? Um, for both questions, about, uh, we received six, like for this question, um, we received 697 responses, which was just over half of respondents. Um, and we took that data, all of the parent comments, and analyzed them for the different themes that may have come up um, and took themes from each. So if a parent just said something like, 
I love my, my children's teachers. That would count as you know one thing. But another parent may have written more and gone into greater detail, and um, and we would have taken <coughs> um, all their different ideas when analyzing the data. And then from there, um, this is a cool word cloud that the computer generated um, with the most common words. Side note. Um, but from there, we took those themes and categorized them in order um, to how often they were mentioned, um, just to kind of better understand what topics parents are most concerned about what, and what parents um, think we're doing well on. Um, so for the first open-ended question, uh, the most commonly mentioned topic was communication. Um, and all types of commu communication were referenced. Um, teacher communication, principal, and district communication. Uh, Seesaw came up a lot, um, and from earlier in tonight's presentations, you can probably see why, um, why it did come up. Seesaw can be, is a very powerful tool. Um, weekly emails, newsletters, all, all different things were mentioned there. Uh, core curriculum also frequently came up. Um, a lot of parents mentioned the recent curriculum updates that some of our, our subjects uh, received as being a highlight. Social emotional learning was also very um, widely mentioned, which uh, shows that some of our work really from the last strategic plan has paid off. Um, as you can see, caring and supportive environments, parent involvement. I think Jason's uh, presentation earlier did a great job of showing some of the ways um, El Sierra is just one school um, really involves its parents. Uh, good teachers, staff, administrators, there were so many comments about our staff, um, which is fantastic. Our technology um, was mentioned a lot, especially in regards to Seesaw. I'm not going to go into all of these, but you can see here some of the other common topics that came up as um, uh, themes of things that we're doing well in District 58, along with some keywords associated with them. So then the other open-ended question is what, um, what's something that District 58 and or your school can improve upon? Um, similarly, we had 694 people respond, just over half of all survey, survey takers. And uh, here's a word cloud that shows some of um, the most frequently mentioned words. And here are the themes. So the most commonly mentioned uh, topic would be core curriculum. Um, 149 people mentioned something related to our core <coughs> uh, subjects. And a lot of the um, comments related to um, the desire to see increased rigor in our, uh, in our, in our curriculum, um, as well as more acceleration. Um, interesting, we had a lot of parents say more homework, and then a lot of parents say, I want my child to have less homework. Um, so there's that definite balance there. Communication came up again. Um, uh, consistency and timeliness were two uh, facets of communication that were frequently mentioned. Um, off a lot of parents said, you know, I have one teacher that communicates with me all the time, I have another that's more infrequent. Is there some kind of standard for communication? Um, and uh, yeah, that was very common. Um, next, facility maintenance and upgrades. 75 people mentioned that. Air conditioning received 36 mentions. Um, facility planning is a big component of our strategic plan, so there's a lot of efforts in place right now to. Uh, really look at our facility needs, um, including air conditioning. Um, parent involvement was another common topic with um, many parents mentioning that the, uh, the timing of a lot of school events wasn't always conducive to um, employed parent schedules. Uh, and then lastly on this page, instructional technology. Um, there were th really three different groups of comments related to technology. One, that we're doing it really well and we should do more. Another, that we're not using technology, ve technology very effectively or as, as effectively as we could and we should improve. And then a third group that said we should not use iPads. Um, and it was very specific to iPad as a type of technology in that third group. Um, I didn't see as much about Chromebook, Chromebooks or um, other areas. 
So again, I'm not going to go through all these topics, but here are a few other uh, common themes that came up and associated keywords. So we have teachers and staff, some specifics there, um, class size, overcrowded schools, um, progress reporting, um, school and district leadership, um, special classes, specifically the desire for increased opportunities in um, art, music, PE, um, etc. Um, social emotional learning, and here another balance where some parents want more, some think we do enough and they want less, um, and then student discipline. And to continue, we have um, there were, uh, t uh, themes related to special education, testing, extracurriculars, the school environment, um, supervision, um, particularly like at recess time around the playground, and then the calendar. Um, later on in tonight's meeting, I believe there's going to be a presentation related to next year's calendar and professional learning models that um, may address some of the concerns raised in, um, uh, among these calendar questions. And then this last page has um, a few smaller themes that came up um, through the survey um, that didn't even include keywords for, but some of them are topics that we've heard before with, you know, moving to grade at six, eight middle schools, some of our safety, security, food services, um, etc. So here they are. So then finally, what's next? Um, all of our building principals and administrators have received the survey results. Um, our principals and their building leadership teams, um, which are groups of teachers, um, will be reviewing the, their school's results and making um, improvements specific to their school based on um, those results. And then at a higher level, district administrators and principals will be reviewing the data to inform district-wide improvements. Um, the Communications Feedback Council I mentioned earlier um, is defining how we can use these results to, um, in a more impactful way. And then lastly, um, we are posting the results on um, our website so that the community can better understand the parent feedback that we receive. So that is a summary of this year's survey results. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, thank you so much. And I have a comment. I, in, the, in the years I've been on the board, this I find is one of the most um, interesting and, and telling things and informative uh, things we do as a district. Um, and, and I guarantee everybody out there, I read all almost 1,400 of them, and I'll read them again because first time through, you, you might miss a few. Mm -hmm. um, and I always find it very interesting, and, and I really use that to, to help my thought process throughout the year because there will be a lot of times where somebody will say, oh, nobody says that. Well, nobody says it in this meeting. Mm -hmm. But we had 1,400 respondents, and you know, 50 of them said this, and sure. your comment is one of, you know, could be one of those 50, but there's 49 other people we're listening to, or 100 people said this. And I think it's interesting when you look at, you know, how it's scattered. Some of them are tough because they'll be the same topic and you'll have just as many positive comments and just as many negative. So yeah. you'll have 100 people saying we're doing a great job at X and 100 people saying we're doing a bad job at X. And I was like, it's just really interesting um, in the comments. But uh, I think it's really telling and I think that it's good as much as information that we can get to the community as possible because you know, a lot of people are willing to share their opinion here, but they're not willing to come to a meeting. Okay. Um, and, and this is, you know, we want to listen to everybody, not just the, you know, one person that gets your attention, but, but all these people. And I really hope that when the buildings get these, they take them seriously, uh, especially recurring themes. Do we ever go back? I know we go, we just talked about how we go with the building. But some of these themes I look on there and I'm like, man, I've seen nine of these, maybe ten of these now. And... Uh, it's the same thing, you know, that specific question maybe pertaining to that specific building year after year after year. How do, how do we address that? And I get it every year there's going to be this or that, and, and, and you got to sometimes sort out. You had a bad experience, but 50 people had a good experience, so what was the difference? But what concerns me is when I can see the continuous improvement request from our parents in here, but I don't see progress in it. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Do we, 
do we just share one thing for one year or do we go and say hey building X this is not only a concern this year this is a concern for 10 years and I don't know I'm assuming that it didn't just start as a trend when I got on the board I'm assuming some of these trends may have been before that so kind of a long-winded comment but then more of a question of what do yeah. we do well I think um, the communications feedback council which is that group that just started this past fall um, to address how we can better use feedback I know we're, we're still in some of um, the formation parts of what we want to how we want to use feedback going forward but I know st uh, school environment survey results are something we'll be discussing and considering and um, I'm hopeful that we can but with that group uh, to find a way to better follow up on some historical trends and identify some some um, more tangible improvements going forward and, you know and I understand you know, there's been a lot of you know, transparency has been a big issue with many many people many groups you know kind of consistently throughout um, how much is information can we share before we can't, you know, I, I mean, I know surveys and people take surveys and, and there's some concern of, uh, you know, what we can share with these individual comments and, and what we can't. How do we determine what we can share and what we can't? We, so we have taken the stance of, <clears throat> in much, much like our, um, our reception of visitors, the, the surveys aren't intended to be a place um, where we're, we're allowing one person to be called out by name. So um, Melissa, the board secretary, has has for many years yeah, um, since we have before I copies, yeah, yeah um, took over has re that position has redacted those names, the personally identifiable information. Um, but otherwise, we post those results online, um, the quantitative as well as the qualitative. Uh, the school teams do receive their schools report so they can look at some of those themes and analyze those and school teams um, in my experience at least do take those results very seriously and they use those results to help design what their school improvement plans will include building leadership teams will design some of their outreach around some of those themes that they see and you know you're right John sometimes those themes are are hard to hard to tackle in um, our school teams I think do a really nice job of of trying to see improvement year over year on some of those recurring themes and I think uh, the quantitative results certainly show that um, and we need to continue to dig into some of those qualitative results as well yeah I, I just think it's one of the most <coughs> honest and open I know mm -hmm. it's a hat you know it's a lot of work for staff and everybody mm -hmm. to do it but every survey I've ever looked at the most important part of the survey is the, is the comments because you sometimes you can't just neatly fit mm -hmm. things in a one, two, three, four, five type box or one, two, three box. So mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate it, and I'll tell you, I think that was one of the best informative tools of the pulse of the community. And you know, you just start seeing trends between schools, or like, hmm, why does this school think that, but this school thinks that? And, you know, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank okay. Thank you very much. Next are communications listed on tonight's agenda are 17 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? Okay, if not, we will move on to the reports to the board and start with the superintendent report with Dr. Krim Scully. Thank you. Um, I just have a few things to report to the board and the community this evening, especially since we have a rather lengthy agenda tonight. Um, first is um, we are excited uh, to present to the board this evening later on the agenda two action items related to the STEM um, curriculum adoption. The STEM committee held a very productive meeting last Monday and together came to consensus regarding the STEM curricular resources. The board will remember a presentation that um, Mr. Sissel gave recently, summarizing some of the options that we were looking at and some of the next steps as well. Um, knowing that that meeting was really important for our teachers to come together and review those resources and, and make some decisions and, and together with our administrative team make a recommendation to the board. And so we are excited um, that they were able to come to consensus They've chosen TCI for kindergarten through fifth grade and iQuest, which is also known as active learning 
for sixth through eighth grade levels. So we're excited for this decision and for the upcoming training that uh, will support our teachers' preparation as they transition um, to these new resources. So pending board approval this evening of the curriculum purchases, um, these resources will be used in full implementation district-wide next school year. So we're really excited about that. Um, and the purchase of these materials will be shared. Um, the costs will be shared over the next three years. Um, as we plan those budgets, we'll certainly fold those in, but the board is aware that um, we have made those kind of financial projections over the next five years, and those assumptions reflect the purchase of these materials. And so they, they certainly are built into those projections that Todd has shared with us uh, many times over at this point. So we're excited about this um, this evening. Second, we, um, with regards to emergency days and making those up, uh, we certainly have had an unusual couple weeks of school cancellations. Uh, I would like to say hopefully the most treacherous winter weather is behind us, but today's weather and tonight's weather uh, seems to be making me a little nervous about saying that. I feel a little bit like a meteorologist uh, recently, so hopefully um, the weather will not be too bad this evening. And, and things will continue as planned. But we have reviewed the uh, this year's school calendar, and we will need to plan for three additional emergency days at the end of the school year. So there's been four days uh, used, and we'll need to make up all four of those. Um, provided we don't uh, need to use any additional emergency days, and it scares me to even say that, we will plan to adjust the calendars to reflect the use of those four emergency days. This would mean that our last day of school would be on Tuesday, June 11th. Okay, so as, our, as is typically our practice, June 11th would uh, include a half day of student attendance and an afternoon of school improvement activities and end of year work for our teachers and staff. Um, we've provided the board with a draft calendar reflecting these revisions. Um, at this time, our plan is to continue to closely monitor weather through February and early March, and we hope to plan. We hope to bring back to the board an adjusted calendar for approval at the March board meeting, and so that will finalize that June 11th um, date as our last day of school. Um, and typically, although we're still working out the final details, typically the middle school promotion ceremony then is the night before the last day of school. So that would put it on Monday, June 10th. Um, since we host those at the at the high schools, we're still working out some of those um, some of the, some of the the scheduling of that. So, and that note, Carrie, mm -hmm. there's been some concern in the past, and I, and I get we have to make up emergency days, and I don't yeah. think the community um, disputes that at all, and everybody kind of agrees. Is there any way we can set the promotion? Because um, that can affect some families, especially if you got people coming from out of town. It can, as you mentioned, it can mm -hmm. af affect facilities. Um, and, and I know this is is maybe different than, than the high schools, but the high school set graduation day. And no matter when the school year ends, graduation day stays the same. Mm -hmm. So even if they add more days on, which they have, and they just came out this past week and said that, they don't change that because mm -hmm. they know that's a that's an event that, that people take pride in and, and want to attend. Mm -hmm. Would there be any drawback to just saying this is when eighth grade promotion happens on this day, regardless? Here, here's the deal, right? Like the high school knows, if you're not passing, three days isn't going to help you, right? So you're, you're going to get, you're going to graduate or you're not going to graduate. So you're either going to get promoted or you're not going to get promoted. So in our district, we have taken the stance um, it, that instructional days are really important for our students. And so um, for our, our eighth grade students, um, those are instructional minutes that would be lost if, in fact, we set, for example, um, the promotion day as um, Wednesday or Thursday of the week prior to what now is the last couple of days of school. Um, it would. Typically, a student is promoted and they don't return to the school for those last four or five days of school. And so um, we have taken the stance in the past that it's important that our students receive as much instructional time and support as possible. However, we could certainly look into that if that's something that the board wishes to do for the upcoming school year. It just has always been our practice that it is the day before the last day of school for eighth grade promotion, which does look and feel a little bit different than the high school um, graduation where they have 
um, received their grades. I understand now at high school, sometimes seniors don't participate in finals. So many of their last couple of days of school mm -hmm. include finals. We don't have that same approach here mm -hmm. at the middle school level. So those are some of the things that we've taken into account. But if it's the board's desire to more firmly set that promotion day, I, I know many of us administratively, and I'm sure our teachers as well, would appreciate um, having the opportunity to, to simply just set it and um, and keep it a, a firm date um, that that would make for some some differences in the way we kind of wrap up the middle school year, especially considering we only have seventh and eighth graders at our middle schools. No, I'm not saying we're at a point of making a decision, but you know, at least it might be something that you know maybe the teachers can, can add to that or the administrators could add to that. We do get parent comments about that. That's one of the typically the, the comments we get is everybody's like, when is it? When is it? You know, right now we're like, we when are you gonna firm year. up the schedule? When are you gonna yeah. firm up the schedule? Mm -hmm. And it's usually eighth grade parents. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily, oh I plan on going on vacation the day after. I mean that happens, but it's mostly it seems to, over the years to have been eighth grade parents because so, we we know, get it typically can. actually at eighth grade and at sixth grade. There's some events that happen right after school lets out in sixth grade, which often um, we, we hear a lot from our sixth grade parents as well. So it, it certainly is something we can look at for eighth grade promotion. Would that I would not advocate for looking at that for sixth grade. Would that end up counting against us as far as the ratings? Because then all those students would be out of school. That's a really good point because, yes, their attendance would need to be reported accurately. And well, why? So just yeah, yeah. thinking outside the box here, um, why are we stuck on the idea that the eighth grade promotion ceremony has to be the penultimate day of school? Why can't it, I mean, why can't we just set it as the second to last day according to the calendar, including the emergency days? So this year, why can't we just set it as the eleventh? I understand that people don't always consider the last day of school to include the emergency days. So many of I've heard from families who've already established vacation plans, mm -hmm. but if we communicate long in advance to people who have eighth graders, the promotion ceremony is going to be, in all likelihood, after school ends. So don't oh, yeah. plan a vacation until after the promotion ceremony if attendance is valuable to you. So I, I would suggest, and I certainly can look for some additional feedback on this, but I think that um, we might not have as many student participants in promotion if we did right. that, if it were four or five days after school is out. Um, students, especially our eighth grade students, would be um, thinking about maybe summer and whatever their next plans mm -hmm. are. I also think it might be difficult for staff, for faculty sure. and our teachers to make arrangements then to um, participate in this the ceremony. And we have many of our, our teachers and principals and others who come out to celebrate mm -hmm. our students as they're promoted to District 99. So certainly, Greg, that's something we could look at as well. Um, I think what might be a, a better option is to look at the other, but it would have an impact on our attendance. So. That's a really good point, Jill, and something we'd have to think carefully we, about I mean, before pursuing that option. Do we have data that demonstrates that if we have, that eighth grade attendance is abysmal following the promotion ceremony? No. Like for four or five days? If, no. if, it, if there's four or five days after the promotion ceremony, we well, have we've never had No, we haven't, it, okay. you know, we haven't done that. You're saying like, go ahead and hold promotion ceremony, but then expect the No, but to Jill's point to was, if we're worried about our, our um, our chronic absenteeism rate with our pair or our ESSA reporting yeah. mm -hmm. is I mean is that is that based on historical evidence that our eighth graders don't show up after promotion or is that just an assumption we've never expected our eighth graders to show up after promotion so it, so we've never had a situation where promotion is day X and then the last day of school is four days later I, I, not that I'm aware of. I'm looking at my team to see if you have any eighth recollection of eighth graders attending four days after promotion ceremony. I, I don't think we've had that experience, at least not in any kind of recent past. I think up to two. Up to two, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and maybe. Yeah, and then they don't they they don't show up to school. They certainly could. Sure. Um, but they typically after promotion ceremony don't. Well, there's a lot of camps and there's a lot of sports uh, activities that travel you know, sports that I've already had people ask me about when the last day is for those people yeah. going out of town for tournaments and things like that so sure I always try to tell people look know. at that last emergency day because mm -hmm. anything you plans are flexible. Right. yeah right right so so I those are certainly carried. things School that time is important I'm, yep. I'm very aware of that <laughs> so those are things certainly we could look at and as we build next year's calendar you know we always do look at when that last day of school is and when likely 
the ceremony might be but you know this has been an unusual year to have four days canceled within one school year um, is unusual I have and a question about that this is a multi and academic that. question um, so we have five days built in it's unusual to have four it is emergency days mm -hmm. in the year yes. in the event that we have two more yes which unlikely but I didn't think we'd have a, an emergency day in November either I did is, is the sixth day just not made up yeah after five days um, it's considered um, an act of God and mm -hmm. so we, we get to <laughs> some of us would think they're all an act of God. <laughs> <laughs> well I don't know those two cold days sure were uh, not the first cold. five <laughs> the first five really <laughs> God doesn't care about the first five. I don't know <laughs> On the sixth day. Okay. I, <laughs> I don't know if that's the way I understand it to be. Um, we can we can forego making up the sixth day, but mm -hmm. like, don't jinx us is all I'm I can not say. To, like, I'm not trying to. <laughs> we're hoping that school okay. will be in session as well. Sorry, I didn't mean to distract it. That's okay. No. I appreciate the question because, John, you're right. We get that question every year, too, and especially in these years where we've had to adjust by four days. Yeah, this is the it most really does become like, pretty significant. I, I, don't as many as well. I think. Um, seven years ago, we had four days, uh, but that was inclusive of a flood, which we had was the a flood very unusual April. Yeah. experience as well, yes. <laughs> um, on that note, though, I will also share, we've received a few questions regarding the possibility of making up school with an e-learning day or some type of a remote learning day. At this time, District 58 does not currently have procedures in place to accommodate this type of an emergency day makeup. Um, however, we would like to consider these opportunities for the future. Um, some of our neighboring districts, especially the high school districts, seem to be exploring this a little bit more, and many are piloting or exploring it with one day to try. Um, so it's something that we'd like to learn from. There are a handful of suburban districts um, at the elementary level that are piloting this approach this school year as well. Again, we hope to learn more from their experiences and to consider some options um, for that in the future. But right now, we, we just aren't quite in a place where we would be jumping in to give that a try. The other thing to keep in mind is the state this year has made some adjustments to how they're counting and calculating student attendance days. and. Um, throughout this year, superintendents and other administrators have really been closely monitoring this because they have changed it a couple of times. Um, many of the adjustments are offering districts more flexibility, um, but there still are some requirements that, and, and some limitations that they've set there, and so there's a little that still is unknown about whether or not um, an e-learning day, um, how it would count and, and how you have to structure it to ensure that it counts adequately. And so, again, we hope to learn more about that. We will be looking at next year's calendar and, and looking to consider some options there. Also some options for where we place those emergency days um, so that there's, there's some information built into the calendar and some opportunities maybe built into the calendar to more flexibly schedule those days if, in fact, the board and... and uh, everyone who contributes to the calendar development can come to some consensus around that. So we'll be bringing back, we have long been aiming for bringing a calendar for next school year in March. You're gonna hear a little more about our calendar development later in tonight's agenda and again at the curriculum workshop. Um, so we'll, we'll keep talking to you about that. Um, third, the superintendent search. Uh, the online survey did in fact launch today. Megan sent out some communications regarding that. They'll be collecting input for the next 10 days via that online survey and we would encourage everyone to log in. It's a pretty quick and simple survey to respond to but that, that responses are really valuable to the recruiters. Um, they just continue to want us to encourage people's uh, responses to the online survey. That's really, really important. In addition, we have our stakeholder input events that are being scheduled for February 20th. Um, the board was provided that um, tentative schedule and I'm looking this evening to just affirm that the schedule of events look good to the board. We hope to advertise that tomorrow. We have some um, two o'clock meetings happening with some of our, our faculty who are a little more flexible. Um, and then right after school, we will host, um, we are planning to host um, an event at each of our middle schools so that our faculty and staff can attend that. And then again in the evening um, at seven o'clock at each of our middle schools so that parents and community members and other faculty and staff, if you can't get to the afternoon event, you can come to the evening event. Again, the goal is to broadly encourage as many people as possible to come out and um, share your input with BWP. That will help to build that profile of 
the next superintendent and help to inform the board's decision as you consider candidates. So the first is I need affirmation that that schedule looks good so we can post and publicize that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any yes. suggestions? Okay. Wonderful. I'll pass that along to BWP. And then first round interviews are being scheduled for Thursday, March 7th in the evening and for Saturday, March 9th in the late afternoon at this point. I'd like to acknowledge um, John Miller for thank you for adjusting your schedule a little bit. I know that that will help um, with BWP and, and the candidates I'm sure as well. Um, right now we're looking at that two to six time frame for scheduling Saturday, March 9th. Um, I think Melissa, we were still waiting to hear back from a couple of board members. Do we have affirmation from everyone that that will work on that tape? I believe so. so as long as that one's yes. The, <laughs> the the Google form said one to five. It did. Oh, but yes. We're we're gonna do two to six. If that works for. Because I my feedback was I I could do two. I couldn't be there at one. Right. So. I've heard from about half, and just need to check in with everyone else. If two, two works. Six is fine. Two to six is good. Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay. Perfect. Um, Melissa will then proceed with BWP and getting that scheduled. For the 20th, mm -hmm. for our engagement in that process, mm -hmm. should we contact Melissa to set up some time with BWP? Yes. She will hold that, that schedule for BWP, and it seems easiest just to schedule that directly with her if it's going to be that on the 20th. Mm -hmm. And I know BWP representatives said that if that date afternoon time doesn't work for members of the board, that they would schedule an alternative conference call or meet on another date with with one of you if that were the case so please reach out to Melissa to secure one of those dates and if one of them doesn't work um, then she'll she'll make sure to put you in touch with BWP directly so that you can schedule that okay thank you and then again reserving March 12th 14th and 15th for the potential final round interviews okay so with the board's approval of the schedule We'll ask Megan to update the website with this information. And we'll start advertising those events, um, hopefully tomorrow, um, sending out invitations and advertising the February 20th. Again, an important date for us. Perfect. Great. And then just two other quick announcements. One is the curriculum workshop is on February 25th. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about professional learning, next year's calendar, as well as some other really important topics at the curriculum workshop on February 25th. We are scheduled on that evening to meet at Fairmont School, so we're excited to be able to visit another school. Um, we also have a visit to Henry Puffer School coming up next week, a board tour and visit with the PTA. And then um, we have the exciting Harlem Wizards event, a fundraising event for our Education Foundation that is uh, scheduled for the afternoon of February 24th. And we would invite members of our community to come on out and enjoy the um, fun and entertainment. We have faculty and staff who will be taking on the Wizards and um, hopefully victorious in that game or at least having a whole lot of fun along the way. So that should be a good time. That is all I have to report. I tried to keep it as brief as possible this week, or this month, I'm sorry. And we have monthly business report if there aren't any other questions. No? Okay. Thank you. Here the monthly bu business report. Uh, all things are going well. Uh, we did receive some state money in Jan January. Um, and in the interest of time, that is the end of my report. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I should point out I did look up uh, Cicada um, cycle starts in 2020 for those interested about you know <laughs> back to the state money <laughs> uh, where, where do we stand on uh, you, you've given us a you've given us updates in the past where do we stand on what where where what are we outstanding on right now and I'd have to go look I mean we they have they have made well, we've we've been paid um, the two payments from the reimbursements from transportation that were due to us in twenty in fiscal year twenty eighteen uh, that were for reimbursements for twenty seventeen. So those are done now. Um, so now we just need the twenty eighteen reimbursements that are due to us in twenty nineteen, which are supposed to be four. So we'll get two of those. Um, as far as that's the transportation money. The special ed money, we did receive some of that. Um, 
that is not already rolled into the evidence-based model. Uh, those came in January. It, you know, we do get some money in January is usually when a state can, can start, you know, has some, some revenue to, to put forth. I'd have to go and add up what they're I'm behind curious, right now. Been, I think it's transportation. They've it, been like two behind. Is that yeah, what and, and the problem is, I mean, for us, last year's claim was significantly higher than the year before. So the budget is based on those some of those payments coming in and that's a larger amount than the ones that we've already received so the next payment when we get them will be a considerable higher amount um, I'm going to presume we're going to get three payments of transportation this year uh, and maybe if they do something significant they'll get a fourth in mid-june I mean depending on how what they're where they're at with their structure and stuff and what they try to get through um, I'm not going to be extremely optimistic on, you know, the state contributing. We'll we'll see what happens after tax receipts come in, and everything gets filed. So, in general, um, we should consider ourselves being just as far behind as we were before. We're not catching up, but we're not falling behind. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's kind of odd. I mean, last year was a three behind. So and, and, and to remember, when you're looking at last year's comparison. Last year was an anomaly because they accelerated payments at the beginning of the fiscal year because they held state aid money um, as they did it dealt with the budget and the evidence-based model. And so last year is really an anomaly because there was a lot more state money coming in because they had to do something to get money to schools so they could open. Because a lot of schools that are dependent on, much more dependent on state money than we are, were very worried about making their first payroll without having some funds and they didn't have state uh, general state aid coming in so there's always when you compare last year this year to last year particularly looking at the at the year-to-date reports it's always going to look a little more skewed than the trend has been over the last four years or five years or whatever it's been since we've you know had a um, significant reduction in the in the payment system so we, we are where we should where we would be every year last year being kind of an outlaw. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, the policy committee has not met since the last board meeting. The legislative committee met January twenty third and member Siegel. Uh, sure. We met and we mainly talked for the legislative breakfast. We are confirmed for the date of March 15th. Um, we do have, same dates have gone out. We do have two representative or two legislators that, that have said they are going, they are able to attend. We're still waiting here on five other legislators. It is an interesting year where we have so many new representatives that, that, that really then is, I think, to some extent, coloring the types of questions that we will ask. Because obviously, the goal is to ask questions that, that the representatives feel comfortable answering, but that also help to educate them about the things that are most important to our district. Um, and so the plan is, at a high level, to really start by asking some questions about education in general, what our priorities are, what, what their priorities are, and then talking about ways that we can work together and, and, and really helping to understand how that outreach could work more effectively. Um, and then we will probably ask some of the same questions that we ask every year regarding funding and uh, perhaps a pension cost shift, property tax freeze, reliability of state funding. I think that's still in flux on exactly how to ask the question, but, but of course that question is going to be asked because it's always asked because it's so important, it, as you've heard, um, the, the stability of funding is so important to our, our forecasting. Um, the only change really versus past years, and I, I do think it's a positive one, was that the committee decided to invite the legislative committee leaders from our surrounding districts, from the other districts that then will feed into District 99 as a way just to have that outreach and, and hopefully then perhaps be invited in turn to the extent that they have events, but to just to try and have that be a little broader conversation and then also to, to make sure the representatives understand obviously that there are a lot of districts with shared interests that, that, that they um, are representing. So that, that's the biggest change. Other than that, I think the format will feel fairly similar, assuming that we don't get snowed out. <laughs> and that's it. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> um, the Financial Advisory Committee has not met since our last board meeting. The district leadership team has not met since our last board meeting. 
and next we'll have a discussion on the facility planning update with Dr. Kermiskoli. Yes, thank you. It is my uh, privilege to introduce Todd Drayfall, who is uh, chair of our facility planning council, and Amy Fuller and Brad Paulson, who are here with us this evening from White & Company, our architect firm. Um, as the board is aware, we have been working diligently on our timeline um, and our goals related to the strategic plan. This evening, we're really going to focus in this presentation on securing the future um, and the work that has been accomplished in steps one and two. So we're really excited to be able to share this, um, the results of this work with the board and with our community this evening. So I will let Todd um, walk us through the first couple of pages here. Thank you. So this is the first big report um, for goal three and for uh, the facility planning council. We've been working since July, August, and the council formed up, I think, in September. Um, and we've had, again, a few delays due to snow and ice and cold and everything else, but um, we've been getting it through. And, and, and White Company has done an incredible job of synthesizing and getting all of the data uh, and it's been a lot of data uh, that they've put together um, very quickly to, to get the, the report. Um, since we had our last engagement session last week. Um, so uh, again, you know, goal three is what in securing the future is you know, our focus on this. Our timeline, um, we're in February, we made some adjustments to it, but we're still working uh, aggressively to get uh, to the board a financial uh, plan uh, in the summer uh, for them to consider review. But there's more community engagement sessions coming uh, <laughs> as part of the each, you know, the next phases. Uh, so after tonight, we will in earnest begin steps, you know, three and four, moving on from there. So, but to recap, um, you know, we this what you're seeing tonight is accumulation of the prior reports going back even to 2012 and that facility assessment updating that with uh, current issues and information as well as going through the visioning uh, sessions that happened uh, first with the facility planning council then uh, at all of the buildings with all the staff and then the two community sessions that we've had um, the community. so that brings us to focusing on what our next steps are uh, and, and moving forward and you know as we kind of work through this this year so at that I will turn it over to Brad Olson from White Company and Amy all right thank you Ted so look, before we set up some of that data that Amy's going to share in a great level of detail and in a very high level for the meeting um, I'm going to kind of talk about the process we use. And anytime we're involved in a facility planning process, the question we always get in any community is why? You know, people understand the need that we have old buildings and, and the infrastructure and buildings that are 40, 50, 60 years old need to be replaced. Um, but buildings also need to adapt to the modern styles of learning that happen so often in education now. So in our conversations with, the com with your community, with the teachers, with the facility planning council. We've had a lot of conversations and shared a lot of statistics about communication, about collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, these core elements that are often so important in those conversations, but also so instrumental to the student experience they have in schools and the t different types of ways students learn today. So as we look at, uh-oh, which button was right here? Yeah. Big button. Big button. <laughs> So as we look at buildings through a different lens, I wanted to give you a quick high level summary of some of the eight things we look for in schools. And these are examples we shared with your community um, to, give, to kind of give us a better uh, glimpse of how well your buildings are aligned with the types of things that we would see typically in a school uh, today as well as tomorrow. So classrooms, modern, modern classrooms are at the core of every learning environment. Modern classrooms are flexible dynamic, they're largely driven by furniture and technology. Uh, these support the notion that the teacher has a different role in the classroom. They're constantly moving around, working with different student groups. So classrooms in a modern school are very active and exciting places to be for students. 
Um, outside of those classrooms are what we would call collaboration spaces. These really serve to extend the learning opportunities outside of the classroom. Corridors are no longer just a place to move kids and exit kids out of the school into the lunch period. So these are spaces for collaboration. These are spaces that are comfortable and tech driven. It's usually supports groups of three to four students. But sometimes you need more than three to four students. You need 30 or 40 students. So we often look for bigger spaces in classrooms where multiple uh, in schools where multiple classes can come together. These are opportunities for interdisciplinary learning. These are opportunities for blended learning. <clears throat> These spaces are very different, multiple functions in the school and are in instrumental to extending the learning environment. Uh, at the core of the school typically is a learning center and the, the traditional school library has been turned inside out. Modern, modern libraries support group work. Uh, they're no longer spaces for silence. These are active, dynamic spaces. Yes, they still have books, but they're now focused around the student activity that happens in a different type of learning style. Usually adjacent to those spaces has been the traditional computer lab. Those are gone. The traditional computer lab is gone. These tech-driven spaces now support a variety of different environments. They support the maker movement. Uh, they support the notion of learning by doing and hopefully doing over if they don't get it right the first time. They, they support STEM curriculum. I understand that's on the agenda a little bit later. Uh, these are messy, uh, clean, filled with lots of kits, equipment, materials that support uh, a cross-section of different types of learning environments. Uh, often, the things we look for, you can't see. You have to feel them. So we look for uh, the types of environment that happens in the classrooms and in the school to, that can have been proven to enhance student achievement. They can improve the use and make efficient use of taxpayer resources, and they can enhance comfort for uh, teachers and students. So we look at the amount of daylight, the amount of views to the outside. We look at and try to measure temperature, humidity, uh, ventilation, CO2 levels. Uh, we try to measure acoustics in the classroom, which has been documented through research to have a direct impact on student achievement. So these are all elements that are critical to a learning environment, and they're much more energy efficient and uh, operationally efficient than they were 50 years ago. Uh, the other thing that's so critical is uh, we recognize that learning happens all over the place and that the dining experience is way different than it was when we were all in school. We hope it's different than when we were in school. So uh, the dining experience really can change a school's culture. Uh, it's a place where social and emotional learning can happen, uh, can be enhanced rather than challenged. Uh, it's a different type of environment. It lets kids connect in a different way. The furniture is integral to that type of environment. So the old cafeteria functions as a multi-purpose room and as a community hub. And then finally, gymnasiums are still the center of the phys physical education class. <coughs> There's a variety of different activities that really complement that. There's a host, host of new spaces that enhance physical fitness, support lifelong wellness, in a variety of different smaller types of spaces that are more focused on individual learning as opposed to team activity. So with that, uh, as, a, as a quick primer for some of the things we looked at in the schools, I'm gonna turn it over to Amy, who's gonna share in great detail the amount of research that uh, we've gathered through a variety of different tools. Thanks, Brad. So, what could this mean for District 58 students? We started with a series of visioning sessions um, for, with the FPC group as well as staff and the community. Um, those visioning sessions included conversation oriented activities um, that w we were either able to gather data and I'm going to share kind of and identify the big picture items that came out of um, those meetings and really resonated with staff and community. So one of the first activities um, had to do with um, the FPC group was given a list of 20 different items. Um, and we narrowed that down through their visioning session down to 10 most essential items, which were then kind of refined into statements that were given to each of the schools for their staff visioning sessions, as well as the two community events that we held. Um, as you'll know, uh, note when you're looking at one being the most essential item and kind of 10 being uh, going down the list 
um, for effective learning environments. A lot of those um, areas kind of gravitated towards human comfort as the top few uh, categories. The next activity focused on an activity that was really geared towards um, the areas for consideration outlined in Strategic Plan three, Goal 3. Uh, this was one of the most exciting activities for a lot of the participants. They were giving a series of dots uh, with different colors to rate priority statements. Um, each group or each person was able to identify and rate their statements um, from a personal <coughs> level, but be able to discuss in their groups what those statements meant and, and maybe have more of a deeper conversation of how they could be applied to District 58. So there were a series of 12 statements per board. There are two sets of boards. The first set of boards dealt with um, statements dealing with safety and security and human comfort. Um, one thing to note on the safety and security and human comfort, um, again, a lot of the, the um, higher uh, points or higher um, dots given for high priorities were ranked towards um, student comfort and human comfort. Just kind of going into to more of the, the details, um, which you can read through thoroughly in the report. The second set of boards focused on, on the grade structure of the buildings and, and looking at moving sixth grade out into the 6-8 uh, middle schools and what does that mean for the elementary school um, buildings as well as what could that mean for the middle school structure. After looking at that, there's um, a lot of positive thinking towards um, having sixth graders um, with middle school curriculum and having the opportunities that are available by, by being with older peers and, and for a longer stay. So after we kind of looked at those two sets of boards separately, um, White and Company gathered all that data across all of the visioning sessions and across um, the staff meetings and summarized uh, what those top priorities were. And one thing to note is that um, through all the participants, it really aligns with your strategic goal three and the objectives that were set forth with uh, uh, goals to consider. And those reinforce that, um, that human comfort, that indoor air quality, Shifting the 6-8 middle school, freeing up space in that elementary school, and providing greater opportunity for sixth graders are key, as well as safety and security are high priorities. From there, kind of that was step one, if you recall the timeline before. Now we kind of move over into step two. And, and what do we have? We really kind of evaluated the buildings as a whole. So the Board of Education and the district for a long time have been invested in, in your buildings. Um, back in 2012, uh, a physical needs assessment was uh, completed. And your facilities team since has been working on projects based on priorities, as well as they continue to refine and, and project out projects based on needs, based on a long-term plan. So what's interesting to note is that your average age of, of your 13 buildings is about 65 years old, with uh, about three additions added on, on average across the board. So kind of the next step was to look at it, okay, what, now that we've looked at the physical building, what about how does it align with education? So this is important because it kind of, it addresses a baseline. And it really looks at um, the support for, for teaching and learning and evaluates it against your district's vision and how well spaces are um, enable modern learning. We know that kids learn differently today than they did before and teaching is delivered in a different manner than it was in the past. So um, the district established um, a core group of people that consisted of FPC members, staff, and they were joined by principals at each school to walk the 13 buildings and evaluate it based on three overarching criteria. White and Company helped provide a template 
for um, this group to go out and evaluate and survey each of your buildings. Um, and from that data, we collected and kind of summarized as a district whole. So we're gonna dive into each one of these areas specifically, but the way it's outlined right now is you're seeing right up here a focus on the building campuses and facility um, configurations. The rating scale is color coded just so it's easy to read. Um, green means good, yellow is fair, and red, and when you see it in the future, is, is kind of poor quality. Overall, your um, building campus, um, which looks at your neighborhoods, the security lighting, site configurations, the play areas, as well as the configurations of the buildings overall um, rank fairly well. When you dive into holistically your learning space survey assessment that groups along um, many different group types, which again, we'll dive in kind of each core learning environment in a moment. Um, but the key point here to look at as a whole is that areas identified in red should not be looked at as a problem, but rather an opportunity for improvement. Some areas, as you'll note, there's a lot of green in your technology right now across the board in, in whether it's core learning spaces, your library, your art, um, across the whole gamut of, of space types. That was something that was identified as a red area in the last strategic plan. So um, making these, these long-term plans really helps show that improvements can be made and addressing those issues can be taken um, in a positive direction. Um, one thing to note holistic, holistically too is a lot of the red areas occur in that human comfort section. So when we talk about human comfort, we talk about air quality, we talk, um, we talk about humidity and acoustics uh, as well as artificial lighting. Brief overview of core learning spaces, and classrooms specifically, again, um, targeting kind of that health and comfort as an area to, to, to look at and monitor, and technology being kind of on that, that great side of your buildings. For non-core learning spaces, such as your library, your art, and your music, one thing you'll notice is that music and art are pretty much similar responses, and that's because in a lot of your buildings, they share the same space. Or um, if they share the same, they might not even share the same space, but they're on a cart and they have to actually go to a different classroom. Across the district, large group spaces such as dining and your gymnasium showed the need for the most improvement to be considered. Um, their health and comfort, again, those key areas that really drive home, but also across the board for the physical qualities of the space along with furniture and, and equipment. And technology in these areas were actually just considered to be fair rather than great. And finally, looking at student support spaces, resource centers, um, sorry, resource spaces, psychology, social workers, speech, and special ed. Again, that need to look at the health and comfort of those spaces, as well as looking at um, the phys physical qualities of those spaces, the size, the shape. Many of those spaces are whatever was left in the building tucked away in, into uh, to small um, either office spaces where they might have to have three or four, five sometimes students in those spaces. Aside from the built environment, um, looking at capacity. And what does capacity mean? That's more than just a student sitting in, in, a, in a seat. Looking at kind of the holistic approach, not room size, number of students, your, your site and, and the building acreage, along with teaching and learning styles. So the information that's listed up here kind of compares um, the district as a whole for building square footage as well as enrollment. But one thing to note about this summary is there's five buildings um, here that host special pro programs with unique enrollment classifications. And so that really skews the data. So it really looks like O'Neill 
um, Henry Puffer, Hillcrest, Indian Trail, and Kingsley have a lot of gross square footage per student, but in reality, a lot of those specialty programs require um, more square footage per student. So one way to look at it instead is kind of looking at um, spatialization across just the building itself and, and data from a percentage standpoint. So we've kind of targeted a if, if the world was perfect and you got to build a brand new school with the most efficient building, here's what the targets would be today for modern learning. Then we looked at it district-wide, um, and, and some of the suggested goals could be by shifting excess core classroom space into co-learning co spaces for, for making and doing. Um, also by enhancing the fine arts and performing um, the performance assembly spaces are, is another area that kind of lacked in, in the overall percentage of, of the buildings. So the next steps, Todd had mentioned the overall timeline. We're looking really at, um, at going forward and, and coming up with that long-term pr plan before summer ends and coming back with that would have options, um, cost estimates, as well as the additional community feedback by that time. And then towards the end of summer, really looking for the board adoption of what that long-term facility plan is. Sorry, just to, the, by the end of summer, I think we're looking for the evaluation of finances so that the board has the chance to really review those. We wouldn't uh, likely be looking for that board adoption until closer to December um, so that there's plenty of time to build out those options, evaluate those options, um, and then over the summer really um, have take the time to digest what those options might mean and what the financing options would look like to support those options or that one option if it comes to um, a, some consensus around an option. Um, but actually the board wouldn't need to take action on that until um, more likely December so that we have plenty of time for, again, community input, um, tweaking of that plan based on some of that input, not only from our community, but from our faculty and staff as well. So. Um, so we're really kind of slow and steady with these steps that we've designed, so. Thank you very much. Are there Thank any you. questions? No. Okay. No. Thank, Thank you very much. Very Thanks. Awesome. <coughs> I'll have a comment, not necessarily for the architects, but I, I think we do have to consider the social emotional aspect mm -hmm. of if we're going to have in expand those middle schools and include sixth graders, uh, because there certainly are studies that, that show it might not be the best situation for a sixth grader to be included with eighth graders with that age difference at that time of their lives. So I think that's it's certainly something that not only the administration should consider, but we need to get some of that information out to the community so that they can in, so that they can have that information and maybe use that to evaluate what they want. Because that could be something that they just, a piece that people don't necessarily think about or have at the front of their minds. Thank you for that, Doug. Actually, um, that those are important questions to be asking in steps three and four. We also have an instructional models review council um, that um, is just getting started, and that council will really be looking at and evaluating um, some of that research behind the instructional model and how we design um, where grades go, if sixth grade does move over, if it doesn't, are there other models we can look at grade level centers or, or other um, organizations of students that we can really um, examine for those benefits and drawbacks, not only to help inform our facility needs, but also to help us to start to think about what our students might need, regardless of um, the facility structure. We have to be thinking about how are we supporting our students through those transitions that occur in their instructional lives. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree, Doug. Yeah, we, we're going to need a little. We're going to need a lot more information mm -hmm. on why we do some things, and yeah. we're going to have to have some stage gates too, because um, if the community has no support for a certain model, we need to know that sooner rather than later. I'd rather not spend months or years and, mm -hmm. and a lot of money going down a path that we don't. So I mean, I, there's. I know it's a moving train, 
but you know if there's three different models we're going down we, we need to make sure before we get too far down the path you know I don't want to design new middle schools only to find out the community has no yeah. desire to do that or grade centers if mm -hmm. the community has no desire to do it why go there yeah and some of that information was was gathered um, as we were doing our strategic plan we asked a specific open-ended question so some of those results um, we can continue to analyze a little bit further but you're absolutely right as we go into this what do we want and some of the gap analysis in looking at priorities it, it shifts from just looking at what our facilities have and can offer to what do we really actually want yeah. within our schools and within our our community so you're absolutely right John in taxpayers <laughs> they want things until you ask them to pay for it sometimes <laughs> so you got to be careful that you know I can ask you, I, I, I have a lot of wants but you know if you tell me you're gonna spend 80 million dollars on an auditorium I'm gonna say no but you know I may be willing to spend 10 you know for just an example yeah, and again, for those reasons, I think that community engagement is really critical at each of the next several steps. And so we'll be working with the FPC and with our architects and our administrative team as well to plan out what those next several steps look like. And also for that reason, we have um, built in some additional time for people to really wrap their heads around what these ideas are, to provide us with more feedback, and for, for the team to continue to um, reevaluate and and redefine what that looks like based on that feedback so we we've really been cautious to not get too far ahead of ourselves and jump to conclusions we want to make sure that we're evaluating each of those elements beyond just what the facilities have and need well internal communication as well mm -hmm. uh, understanding the impact that this has on curriculum and the alignment that we're doing there the right. programs that we're now investing in mm -hmm. and um, does that align better with one model over right. the other uh, I think that's going to be really important as well because I think that when we communicate with the community, part of what we want to be able to explain is why we're going down that path and that gives them an opportunity to, to weigh out options, um, keeping sixth graders with a younger group of children or getting them, you know, if, if curriculum aligns better. And then they have an option to kind of pick between um, and what is better for their, for their children. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll discuss professional learning model and the 2019-20 school calendar with Dr. Permascoli. Right, and really, uh, um, Mr. Sissel is going to talk us through this. We have talked with the board quite a bit about our professional learning needs. Our new strategic plan really calls for some improvements to our curriculum, but also to the way in which we support our staff through professional learning opportunities. And so we've been talking uh, really a whole lot about the need for ongoing professional learning for our staff. Um, our calendar right now offers institute days and some of the more traditional learning opportunities we've been exploring and um, really investigating opportunities for more consistent and ongoing collaboration with our with our teachers and with our faculty. Um, we know that we're challenged at times with sub time and with um, lost instructional time and so we're really try we've been trying to come up with a model that that might support the professional learning needs while also really paying attention to the quality educational programs that we're offering our students as we continue to improve our curriculum so uh, with that um, Justin will walk us through some of the ideas and offer some insight and, and we're hoping ultimately at this session not to get a nod from the board but to hear what some of the questions might be and what some of the needs for additional information might be we're planning right now for this to be an important topic of discussion at our curriculum workshop in a couple of weeks and then ultimately our aim would be to bring back a, a calendar for approval by the board at the march board meeting so we've really been trying kind of like we were saying with the facility planning to take um, a, a slow and purposeful approach to this offering as much information as we possibly can so we're eager to hear your questions and your feedback this evening and if you don't think of them tonight please reach out to us so that at that curriculum workshop we can make sure that we're prepared to answer those questions and offer whatever additional insight might be useful to the board um, we're certain we'll, we'll hear some feedback from our community as well so with that Justin please 
thanks, Dr. Kramer's colleague. It'll actually be Jane and I who have co-authored the presentation, so we'll walk through that. Before I start talking about quality learning experiences, um, if we were in a, a learning situation that had gone on two hours, I would offer at least a stretch break. I just stood up and it felt really nice. So, <laughs> do you want to just really? I mean, do you want to just stand up physically and then? And, I mean, if you, I'm, I'm actually and serious. <laughs> 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 I also want your undivided attention, so this is a <laughs> cool. Sure you, you can present while we're standing. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? So, <laughs> except for the feel camera. free to, yeah, <laughs> make sure. Make sure that <laughs> So, as, as Dr. Kremiscoli alluded to, there have been a number of conversations around uh, the needs throughout the district, um, and, and it's come from a variety of directions. Coming out of strategic planning, we formed the Curriculum Council, which has looked at our implementation and, and potential and actual adoption sequence of new resources, and that's up on the screen right now. Um, that group, when it, when it sort of made that recommendation as, and, and a similar response from our administrative team said, this recommendation feels plausible if we can continue to increase our support around the professional learning that will be required to implement these kinds of things. We have a group called the Professional Learning Council that came out of strategic planning. That's a group of teachers and administrators who have begun looking in depth at the, the real research and, and, and actual, you know, our own experiences behind high quality professional learning and what that really means. And, and it's more than just the, the learning and the moment and the time to receive instruction on new strategies. It's, it's the time to implement and then the time to come back and reflect around that implementation and talk to people who have had similar implementation experiences, learning from each other and being able to, you know, we, when we talked about the, the movement of the Institute Day, for example, we talked about wanting to make sure teachers had time to immediately implement the learning. Rather than putting it in June, we, we put it in February so that we could make that happen. Additionally, we want to have time for teachers to come together and reflect and share those experiences. We've had those experiences this week with our K-6 grade level meetings and just watching the, the power of the conversations around the nuances of implementation and how are you experiencing that, what's working for you. It really gives us a chance not only to, to harness what's happening in our classrooms, but to, to build toward consistency because when the teachers from across the district have a chance to have those conversations and even within buildings across grade levels we start to, to gain even more the student experience quality continues to increase the consistency piece that Carrie mentioned also is a, is a major component of that. Anecdotally, when I was at Pierce Downer, there were a large number of teachers, or a large percentage of teachers, I should say, on the staff that were pursuing a master's degree together at the same time as part of a cohort. Classes met Wednesday evenings. Thursdays were awesome days to walk around because new things were happening as a result of those conversations. And then they had the chance to come together both in the, in, in the lunchroom and, and on their own time, as well as regularly through that class and reflect upon what was happening as they were trying new things and to continue to build upon that. It really, really moved the needle on instruction for those individuals because they had that consistent time. We've looked at a number of models, first through the Professional Learning Council and second through the administrative team, and we've, we've, we've tried to consider all possibilities that could be out there. We started talking about a late start. We thought about alignment with District 99, um, and that is a possibility. However, right now, because District 99 does it, if we were to, we, we talked about aligning more directly with them, it presents some transportation challenges for us to be able to share the busing. We were looking sort of at this, the Mondays for similar reasons, because that's the day already impacted on the calendar quite a bit. So that was one of the, the challenges with that model. We've been using half days, and there is certainly the, the learning that happens on those days is effective and is powerful, and yet that consistency piece doesn't really tend to exist as much. There's, there's you know, a, a challenge to be able to have those frequently enough to have the consistent return. There's also impact on our instruction when you're taking off. We've typically done half days where we're releasing students for the afternoon, and that eventually over time create some instructional inequity based on our special schedules and certain schedules in the middle schools as well. We even talked about additional full institute days and what that could look like. But again, when you're, when you're in a, the difference between a five and six hour learning session and a three hour or a 90 minute session, there is some point of diminished returns after that. It's that they're intense days when we have them and we, and we think about, we, we value those days, but it also, again, is going to not work toward consistency. And currently, under the current legislation, we can't count those full days as part of student attendance days, whereas even half days could be, or and certainly an early release concept would be. And so we've landed on, on our focus right now on the concept of early release, the, the things we believe 
believe this will help us to accomplish, again, is that consistency. It's also the frequency, having something that happens more regularly uh, allows us to continue to come back to a variety of different learning models. And it gives us a little more flexibility with, with what will be happening within those days. So um, let me get to the next slide and I'll get a little more into that concept. We wanted to see what was happening around us because we know that these aren't brand new concepts. They've been implemented with a significant degree of success in many districts. And so this is certainly not intended, it's not a comprehensive survey, it's the responses we got at the time that we were able to, to ask the questions. But of 24 elementary districts that responded to, that we were able to gather information about, 23 used some kind of one of the things I just described on the previous slide to accomplish professional learning. Only one in that group replied with a late start. Five use half days, 17 use early release, and if you start doing the math, you can see some use a combination. Um, some of the, just a couple of districts around us that are currently using early release, and 11 of the elementary districts are using an early release model on a weekly basis, which means rather than every other week or once a month, they are um, offering an early release each week. And so, this is what we would like to propose and suggest would be the most powerful way to accomplish all of the things that we know we need to accomplish over the next several years. We would, it would be a weekly two o'clock release or dismissal, excuse me, for students in grades K through eight. That's one of the important components of the consistency is we want this to be available across our entire K-8 staff so that we can work. We often look for ways to think about the sixth through seventh grade transition so that we want to be able to have that happen. We have teachers who teach in, in multiple settings and we really want to make sure that all of those opportunities are available. It would yield then 90 minutes on each of those Mondays for all of those certified staff members to have an opportunity to engage in professional learning. The one group not captured in that model specifically is preschool. We're working to develop a schedule for our preschool teachers that will accomplish something similar. Preschool is the only place right now where we have unique AM and PM classes where the, the, the children who attend in the afternoon do not attend in the morning. And so we, didn't, we, don't, we want to make sure that we don't have an adverse impact on that program while we still value providing the time for professional learning for those staff members. What would this time look like? There are three broad categories that we see being, um, everything would kind of fall into. One of the first is the, a number of these Mondays would be district-driven professional learning. They're speaking to the curriculum implementation, the instruction that goes along with that, the integration of technology with that curriculum implementation. These are things that are happening now, yes, on our institute days and at our grade level half days, but this would allow, again, with some more regularity, some more consistency, and even working into some smaller groups where we might bring together the, the third grade teachers from the north side schools. So a slightly smaller group, but again, able to capture some cross-district conversations. Or we might bring together the third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers from three schools and, and have some of those conversations and stagger that across the Mondays so that we can continue to ensure there's consistency, the same message is being received, and yet those collaboration opportunities are happening even within the district-driven learning. And it's important to realize that, you know, while we've laid out an implementation schedule where, for example, we at the end of this year will be fully implemented in English language arts, benchmark and study sync, where it will be through the first full year for all teachers. But that doesn't mean the learning around that implementation ceases in, in May of 2019. We need to continue to reflect and support those experiences even as we implement science next year, even as we potentially implement math going forward. Does the focus shift a little bit? It does, but if we, if I don't think any of the teachers that we're working with right now through the grade level meetings we've had this week would say that they're done learning about benchmark and they're done learning about study sync. They've only really gone through it once. And so that ongoing support is going to be important as we go forward. Another portion of the Mondays would be driven by building agendas. So many of our half days right now are, are, are essentially our principals are responsible for creating the content that happens for teachers on those days. This is going to allow, again, a more consistent structure to get back to some of the building initiatives that the principals set as professional goals for them and their staff at the beginning of each year. It's also going to give us a chance to spend more time in, again, a more frequent, consistent manner talking about student instructional strategies based on looking at data, those kinds of meetings where we, we bring a team together and we say, let's talk about these couple of students today and really make sure that we have all wrapped our heads around what their needs are. Right now, those meetings are happening occasionally after school, occasionally before school. We just heard a teacher say this evening, one of the things that will be so great is this is time that everyone will always be available. It's, it, it's a time that would be there for those meetings to ensure that we're giving our teachers adequate time to, to collaborate around those instructional decisions. 
And then a third portion of the Mondays would frankly not be driven by an administrator created agenda. We have honored with, through the teacher workday, and we've honored through a, a number of professional learning opportunities already embedded uh, the concept that sometimes teachers know what they need from each other. And so it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a free for all, it wouldn't be time without accountability, but it would be a time for teacher driven professional learning, allowing for some choice, allowing for some input as to what that should look like. And, and again, we're emphasizing the collaborative nature of it. This isn't professional learning around catching up on grading. This is actual time where we're going to work with our peers and be able to talk about what, we, what, what, we're, what we're doing together, to be able to share the ideas that are being implemented, to be able to share the strategies and the successes and failures. This also allows opportunities for our specialist groups to be able to meet together as a group, which is something we have had. It's challenging to capture that time for our art teachers, our music teachers, our PE teachers, and then even our special services and all of those groups can, can both share in the learning with a larger faculty group and also could propose and suggest sometimes that they could really work together on topics that they would ultimately select and we would ultimately agree that this is valuable time for them to be spending. What will it do to the calendar overall? We would keep the four full day institute days. Those are the days that are approved by the Regional Office of Education. Now two of those don't impact, they happen before student attendance begins in August. And then we have another one typically in November and then typically in March, that's the county day. Um, these days are what provide teachers with professional learning credit to maintain their licensure. So it's, it's important that we keep these. They're also part of the approved calendar, so those stay. To uh, account for some of the time that would be shifting, we would be removing from the calendar the half days that have tradition that this year for example were in September and May so those would be turned to being student attendance minutes we would also remove the teacher work day from the calendar so that would be another full day of student attendance would be placing back into the calendar and then we're hoping to see eventually a more significant and initially at least an appreciable reduction in the use of substitute teachers I've been mentioning our grade level con um, meetings where we bring together all of the kindergarten teachers for half a day and then all of the first grade teachers etc right now we have three of those in the calendar because that time is so valuable to us. Next year, we're anticipating with all of this reducing to reducing definitely to two, and then continuing to reflect on how much of that time we continue to need. So essentially, again, that's another three hours that teachers are back in the classroom if we if we take that half day away. Everything I've said thus far, because we know that one of the big questions around this is, well, what does it actually mean for instructional time over the course of the year? Everything I've said thus far is a net reduction in instructional time. Even with putting the half days back in and putting the work day back in, we're still, we would still see a, a net loss of somewhere in the neighborhood of 15, 17 hours of instructional time. So then we started talking about ways to capture additional time to try to offset any loss in actual student contact time. So if we were to add five minutes to the student day, it actually brings the difference down to a negligible point. You have to think about specifically where the other things on the calendar are going to fall before you can get to an exact number of minutes, but it, it gets to a point where it's a, it's, a, it's a negligible difference within an hour or two across the course of the school year. However, if we were to add 10 minutes to the student day, so for example, if we were to start the student day at 10 minutes earlier, or add five minutes at the beginning and five minutes at the end of each day, we actually yield a net gain in instructional time that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 14 hours. And so that, frankly, is, is bolded on that slide for a reason, because it's what we'd like to suggest um, concluding in this concept for next year. Not only does it offset the loss of instructional time for the early release, but if, if we think back to a, about a year ago, we increased um, PE and art, for example, at the elementary schools. It, it's wonderful to increase those minutes, but those minutes come from somewhere. And so this helps to replace some of the minutes that were taken from other subject areas when we increased those kinds of things. So the, the addition of 10 minutes, we're still working out exactly what the, the least impactful way is on, in, in terms of all of our systems to add that 10 minutes, and, and that's what we'll be continuing to work on. I think that's where we're switching. It's too long wait time. A lot of information. <laughs> Obviously, I think it's important to say that this is not a recommendation that we've taken lightly. We absolutely recognize this as a shift. And so as our team worked, as we worked with the principals, as we worked with our grade level teams, we began the conversations about what, what do you see as the impact? What are the things we need to be thinking about? Other areas of impact that we are, have already considered and are working on and will continue to gather information about um, are listed here, transportation, the timing of the routes, what would that mean for cost? Would it mean additional cost? What would that cost be if in fact it did? 
after school care, uh, reaching out to champions. Obviously, parents are going to be wondering and thinking about how does that impact what I need to do for my children, for my child, to make sure that I have the, that, that time where the kids have supervision. Um, and so yes, champions will extend their hours. What does that mean? The specifics, that is something we recognize. We need to continue gathering information. Our parents will be wanting that information. Our after school events on the Mondays, it will impact, uh, we obviously would not schedule practices because we really feel that that professional learning time is critical. Uh, when working with the middle schools, it was interesting. So because other districts have already captured the Monday as an early release, um, there are already not that many after school activities, that, uh, the games scheduled. And so from the middle school perspective, our principals are feeling like, no, we can, we can reorganize when those practices are. It won't be a large issue with games. We will make sure we have, don't have band and orchestra practice after, after on a Monday. And then the other important conversation is around the instructional assistants. Um, that is a very important group. They are very supportive in our schools with students. Our teachers find the work and time with them beneficial as well. So we've started having conversations, one, with the ESP Association in that we are not looking to reduce their overall work week, um, which we already feel is, is minimal. They're already, we're already scrambling to feel they have enough time. But number two, continuing our conversations to really look at when would it be beneficial, how often would it be beneficial that they do stay on the Mondays and for that collaboration pur purposes, for talking about the student needs and how to program and support students. As next steps and steps, some of these steps we've already um, begun. As Justin said, we've met with our K-6 grade levels, our teachers these past few weeks to get there. Feedback, input, what else are we missing, what's your feel, every grade level. Um, very, I would say, strongly supported the, this is important, yes, we want to move forward, yes, we want to support this, um, in order to really make sure we're doing the best we can as we support and teach kids. We will be meeting with the middle school staff this week, Friday, and then, as Carrie mentioned, the curriculum workshop, we're really hoping, let's, let's continue to, to think about what are all those different pieces that we need to have answers for and be able to support and be able to um, be thinking about to come back to that curriculum workshop, and which is an evening with an extended reception of visitors, and talk a little bit more and have some answers to any questions, questions from our board, um, about how might we handle this, how might we handle that, what are our next steps and thoughts. And then, obviously, we think it's very important to make sure we're soliciting parent input on ways that the district can support families as we transition to early release days. I thought was that with that, because there are other districts that have transitioned, we can reach out to can see what steps and what they've had to plan, as well as hearing from our, from our parents so we can help support them through the transition. Along with this support for professional learning, we've talked about the time, but it's not time alone. And this is another big piece um, to the conversation, is to really feel confident that we can appropriately support the professional learning and the implementation and the changes that are coming into the district or <laughs> in the next few years. We will be recommending the addition of a curriculum coordinator, a curriculum coordinator position to some degree. This, if you notice, the ultimate target that is not a, tar a one year target, that is not something we're thinking is feasible for next school year. We would like to get to a place where we can get to the four part time curricular co curriculum coordinator roles. And really, the vision of that position is a half time assistant principal. The benefit to that is that assistant principals aren't traveling between the two buildings, learning two families, two sets of events, two. Um, they can really focus and have one home base for their home school as an assistant principal, but then also really work on the curriculum and instruction, the leadership um, to support, which I will actually in the next slide talk more about what their role is. And um, part of this decision to really have that target and decide you know, how much for next year, how much is feasible for the following, is looking at obviously the, buzz, the budget, the implications there, the role development, this is a new position. We want to make sure we take some time and 
and properly phase in this position, as well as looking at the timing of the curricular initiatives that Justin spoke about. So what would, that, what would the responsibilities look like? What could this position look like? Support for the curricular, the implementations, which is you know, another, more people, more staff to help us really support the committee work, the council work that falls quite a bit on teachers, teacher leaders, administrators, where we have people are stretched so thin right now. Our, our staff is outstanding. I think our administrative team, our building administrators chip in and have taken pieces. But really to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish, we're spread too, th too thin, quite frankly, and we need additional support. Um, someone that's going to become the point person for a new adoption. Perhaps we identify science for one position, math for the other position, ELA, as well as supporting the specialist groups, art, PE, music. Um, again, with those ultimately that target of four, we feel we can better support the growth and development of all the different specialist groups that we right now don't feel we're doing a very good job with or a good enough job with. Um, the position can provide that direct support, working with staff on instructional strategies that accompany a new implementation. So we're supporting teachers, we're supporting the work of our building principals, um, the role would work with the instructional coaches, and the role is supporting the work of the, the central office administrative team. One of the things that we've talked about with this position, because the, a curriculum coordinator position in and of itself does not necessarily have to be an administrative position. Um, we do feel that the needs are such and the benefits at this point for that position, we, we would recommend it as an administrative position um, for a couple different reasons. One is that calendar. The work extends beyond the teacher calendar, the teacher contract um, responsibilities. We would need that flexibility of someone to help work with our teams in the summer, our administrative teams. Um, new teachers in August, planning with the curriculum department outside of that, that work calendar, as I said. The other piece is a topic that you've heard a couple times, and that's need, the need for support for our building administrators related to evaluation of staff. Um, the demands of the teacher evaluation framework to really facilitate that process and do it well, and have it be meaningful for both our teachers and the administrators, and to really lead to growth. Um, we're stretched pretty thin, and we continue to hear we need more support in that area. Having this position be an administrative position would allow us to share that responsibility for evaluation and allow us for that flexibility in the schedule that we think we need to successfully support the implementations across the district. So with that, I mean, Justin, is there anything to add? Or, or Carrie, before we go to great job. questions? <coughs> Take questions. I just want to make a comment. Um, my niece, who is um, 27 years, will be 27 years old, and has four years under her belt, um, and is a graduate of District 58 and 99, um, teaches in Phoenix. Um, she taught in the Phoenix School as well as now works in Chandler. And in both districts, um, she just went into the early release every Wednesday at 1 o'clock. Um, so I've been talking to her about what she finds the benefits. She did do some part-time um, maternity coverage in Chicago Ridge as well as in District 58. Um, and she just, she said she, even though she's a newer teacher, she said the amount of things that she, they as a team, both in her entire building as well as in her um, grade team is stuff that would never get done. Mm -hmm. um, she still has a ridiculous amount of work that she brings home every night. She was grading papers, a big stack during the Super Bowl <laughs> because that's what teachers do. Um, but she could not say enough of what a wonderful thing she she's on top they are on top of technology they are on top of all their curriculum and for the amount of money um, and the time that we have asked our teachers um, and administrative staff to spend the last two to three years four years looking at all these curriculum the strategic plan um, we want all of this curriculum to 
to be beneficial and to grow and um, I was kind of hoping that this is what the teachers and administration would be <laughs> recommending because I think it is a good answer not without its problems and its growth there's always the little pains of or big pains um, but once we set the calendar and it's consistent I think it's easier for parents versus those individual days and you just that's just what you do and I just really think that um, this is extremely important for what, what we need to do to support the teachers and the administration in the at when it's all said and done a good million dollars worth of investment in curriculum mm -hmm. yeah. thank you joe we we appreciate that anecdotal kind of information i think that our administrative team have heard much of the same from our faculty and staff and from our neighbors our neighboring districts in our conversations with them um i think and arizona is one of the worst or is the <laughs> worst state and that is one thing that a lot of the districts in arizona actually do for their teachers yeah I which i thought was a strange <laughs> a uh, little complex relationship but they see as that that as something very important yeah. yeah absolutely it's clearly something that is super important and we know that if we are to accomplish the work that lies ahead for our teachers and most importantly for our students that consistent time is really really critical so I think after looking at all of the options and there were a lot on the table when we started these discussions many months ago um, but I think this option really gives us that consistency with uh, minimal to no impact on the actual student instructional minutes. Um, I applaud our team for really coming up with a creative solution that I think um, families certainly will feel an impact and we need to be sensitive to that and continue to find ways to support them in that transition. But I think a two o'clock dismiss dismissal time um, for many families will be something that um, with some support through the transition um, will be successful and they'll be able to accommodate. Meanwhile, our faculty and staff are really capturing the time that they need to be successful with our students in the time that we have them within our schools. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just gonna jump in. Uh, I, I think one thing we certainly heard loud and clear through everything we've done is we need to, to find ways to have more professional development for their teachers. What would help me, looking ahead to the curriculum workshop, would be to see some examples of how that 90 minutes might be structured relative to how that half day is structured. Or how the, the, this kind of some of the specific types of things, not to go into the great detail, but it would really help me to, to understand. I think it would help the community to understand a little more what types of things would be accomplished, all the benefits to the teachers, and, and where, what some of the learnings that might come from that. That, that would certainly help me to, to I, I understand it more now. With, with I think your context but I think even a little more would help me yeah I, I would echo that I mean just in the same way when we're, we're this is a similar amount a similar investment as to what we did with say technology or mm -hmm. curriculum mm -hmm. um, we're not spending the same dollar amount but we're investing time mm -hmm. and that time is going to the way we're investing is going to impact you know our, 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 our outputs so I'm definitely interested in seeing um, a, a more clear vision of what um, this would look like at the same time, I, I'll echo your comment. I'll echo the same sentiments that, that Jill put forth. I am extremely um, interested in seeing uh, the area of impact related to, to families. Um, because I'll just, just share anecdotally. Since I've been on board, the, the, the thing I've heard about most, which actually surprised me from people in my network, or people outside my network who've, who know I'm a board, board member and they just kind of uh, speak to me in public or privately, um, was shifting that day to, to um, this, the... Friday. Yeah, to Friday. Having the non-attendance day on Friday to make up for the November emergency day. That was where I've gotten most people to reach out to me. And that surprised me, because I thought people would be more interested in talking to me about curriculum of the superintendent higher or something. Something a little bit flashier. Um, but that has, that, just that disruption felt, caused people to feel the need to, to reach out. So I am keenly interested in seeing well, what kind of feedback we can get from families when it comes to telling them you're gonna have to um, adjust and what our supports will look like. You talk about support to the transition that we can offer based on what, what other districts have done in the past. I'm very interested in seeing what that will look like. I want to start by saying that um, if we want to hit a role of increasing our rigor, I think personal development is incredibly important. Um, we're asking a lot out of 
you and and our teachers with with all the implementation that we're doing and we, I think that it's going to be really really important to bring consistency to our curriculum across the board and I see value uh, in, in making sure we increase that time um, at the same time this is a big shift in model in what we're doing and um, so that I think there's a lot of questions that I have with that. Uh, I have some connections to some of the, the districts that you referenced, and I've talked to some of the teachers in there, and quite honestly, I felt like their reaction to how they utilize their time was mixed, in that they felt some of their days were very, very useful and impactful, and some of them were not as much. And so I think to echo a, you know, a little bit of what Elizabeth was saying is, if we were to be willing to make a change to this type of model, I'd like to know how we're going to be, in maybe a little bit more detail than we would normally in a, in a traditional year, looking at it because it would be a change for us, how we want to utilize that day. Um, do nine, does the 90 minute model work as opposed to having more hours um, to do it in one time? Uh, I think the impact that this has, I'd like to know that the impact that this will have on specials, because while you're increasing the total hours of, of face time that our students have it, you know, with their teachers, um, taking a block of 50 minutes is not the same as, as segmenting out um, an additional 10 minutes per day. So how does that impact happen on, you know, on, on PE, on art, on music? You know, what are you envisioning to make sure that there's some, some real consistency there and we're not not losing um, too much there. Um, I would really, really like to see an increase. If we're going to do this, I'd like, and I know you're, you're talking about potentially, but I think that making sure that it's, it's teacher and student face time and, and really looking at reducing um, as much as we can that substitute time, I think cost-wise that's beneficial to us, but also just I think educationally, um, I really value that time that they that they put into that, but I also value the time that you know my children spend with their teacher. I think that that's a more in, in, impactful time. I think also we got to consider that the impact that this is going to have on families um, and what that looks like for their day. I think that I'm less concerned about the impact in the afternoon than in the morning. I just think with consistency with young children, I. I'm not nearly as concerned um, with the afternoon. I think that that's a little bit easier to you know to work with, but it's still going to have an impact. And so I would really like to understand the impact that our families feel that this is going to have. And if we did this, I would like to kind of look at that first year more as a pilot program and really sort of do some follow up with the families and see how they feel once that process is ongoing because sometimes something can seem scary um, but once you get into it you find that it actually works quite well and if you're seeing um, better learning coming out of it more consistency uh, we may see more value out of that but I want to make sure that we're getting that value <coughs> that our teachers are seeing real value in that time that, that was created and that that 90 minute model really works for the type of learning that, that we want to have just to emphasize your last point, we talk about um, collecting data from the families. We also need, I mean, you kind of said it, but I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm stressing it because it's important to me too, that we are also collecting voice data from the teachers as well yes. to make sure that this is useful to them. Right. Because we don't need to have six months of professional, six hours of professional development each month that they don't find to be worth their time. It's a bad investment of their time. They'd rather be doing something else or they're not getting anything out of it that they, we need them to get out of it to put into practice. I have that in my notes. I'm sorry I didn't say that. Yes, absolutely. We, we need to make sure that, um, that you know, whether we're, I, I think, some kind of survey across the board really to make sure that, that, that every individual teacher from our veterans to our, to our new teachers are, are feeling a lot of value coming out of that. I think that's the only way um, that I see value in making a, a big shift like this. I, you know, I, I appreciate the adjustments to make sure that, that our hours are in, and, and this may have less of an impact than taking a, a, a full day off or a half day off. I can only speculate based on my family and, and the couple people I connect with. Um, 
Um, it, for some, it's going to be har much harder. They've got it exactly timed out to their day. It's, some people, it's much more impactful on their family when they have to figure out that random rogue day, like like we've heard on this on this coming Friday. So, um, I think that's most of my my notes. And, and I appreciate the the kind of we don't have a set it and forget it model with our with our curriculum. It's not like all right, we moved on from ELA. I think that having consistent time allows us to revisit all of our curriculum and and that was that that resonated with me a little bit so as well yeah Mike yeah I think this is great progress I, I mean everybody has to be on board rowing in the same direction on this one so communication is critical and it can't be a one-sided communication it's got to be communication with everybody kind of saying yes the teachers are on board with this. The, the administrative staff is on board with this. The central administrative staff is on board with this. Our parents need to know why this is. Ultimately, our parents are our customers. Children are the number one reason we're here. The parents choose to send their kids to this district. They can choose to send them to private school, possibly. Um, so their feedback is, is always important. Um, and. Uh, you know, we just need to make the, you're never gonna make everybody happy. So, you know, if 10 people show up and scream at us that we're doing it, I mean, we, we need to understand, is that 10 people upset or is that, you know, a thousand people upset? So just always be aware of that because I'm always leery because the, the person that's the most upset usually yells the loudest and we don't want to make sure, we just want to make sure everybody understands why we're doing, what we're doing, whatever we end up doing. Um, but I, 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 I echo the continuous updates of, what this is you know a lot of these things start off very well whether it's here it's just any organization right anything you do you got to kind of constantly monitor over the year over the years why we do it is it effective um and, and so it doesn't get stale uh you know i have talked to i this is i did broach this with some people i know that work in other districts and that i respect their opinion and they say it starts out well and then then about half of what you do is a waste of time and i want to make sure we don't get to that point where half of what we do is a waste of time i you know so how do we independently survey those involved I mean, six months into it a year at, at the end of the school year how do we blindly and independently survey teachers to say do you think this is effective and have a line where they can write a comment in there and this isn't uh you know coordinated consolidated and everybody puts the same answers in in the building and they all sit in the room together <laughs> this is whenever they want to if they feel like filling out a survey that's here just like that's why i find the parent survey so refreshing people don't have to feel um they feel they, they can feel like they can lay it out there sometimes people lay it out there a little more than i would like but um, you know it gets colorful um but just it needs to be effective i think we're on the right path um i just want to make sure everybody agrees i've heard from administration how this is if there's if if that's truly how everybody believes and you know we'll, we'll know more about it the 25th right yep. okay. um, maybe that will be a good question to ask during superintendent interviews how do they yeah how do they handle how will they handle yeah, that could be a question you can answer yeah, yeah. but uh, definitely make sure the parents understand whatever we do why we're doing it and again you know there's nothing wrong with People love filling out surveys, apparently. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, we can send out a thing. Yeah. If if we get to a point where, we're, is this better or is this better? And, you know, maybe the teachers are like, hey, we would be able to do two of these and the administration would be able to do these. You know, maybe we do send out a survey and say, we could do this or this. I'll tell you, I did ask some of my pediatrician folks where they work, because they did, if, for those of you familiar with the studies about teenagers, um, why most high schools actually do the late start is because teenagers actually do perform better when they sleep in and wake up at 9 o'clock to go to school. It's actually the opposite for, for many youngsters. Um, grade school kids um, uh, tend to do a little bit better in, in the morning. They, they are more early risers than, than some, you know, anybody that's got some teenagers, trust me, I know. Um, so, and, so not only that, I think there is evidence out there that a, an early dismissal was probably better for a grade school district. Mm -hmm. And from a work standpoint, most people you talk to tend to say it's easier having that constant, absolute start time all the time 
and because of the way you get into work, the way the trains run. So anyway, so I think I'm not saying anything different than anyone else, but you, know, you have to monitor this stuff. You have to go and ask people mm -hmm. how did it work. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, and I think it, you've each raised a number of really good questions for us to spend some time thinking about. I think over the last couple of years, we have developed some ways to capture some of that feedback from our faculty and staff through surveys and discussions and open-ended questions, and, and I'm confident we'll be able to continue doing that. Um, so we, it will need to be a, a work in progress and something we continue to evaluate throughout next year and for many years to come as we evaluate what's the most effective use of that time and and um, making sure that our faculty and staff are feeling like it's it really is an ongoing productive use of their time. Um, and I think working with families to figure out how best to support that, I, I agree. Having looked at a variety of options, I think a early dismissal makes a whole lot more sense for families with younger children than does a late start. Um, high school might be a little bit different. Um, uh, but for our elementary school, school students, they are. They're a little more independent, <laughs> yeah, a little a less more. dependent on, on child care and transportation and all the other things. So um, th this does seem like a, a, a good middle ground for, for our district to approach. And what we've heard from other elementary districts, too, is that in, in early dismissal, works a whole lot better at elementary school than a, a late start. Mm -hmm. um, that predictability and schedule for younger students is really important, John, and I know that's what you were touching on as well. Yeah, it, it, mm -hmm. much more so at the younger age. And I guess just one of the things, if possible, by the curriculum workshop is to see if the Park District, the Y mm -hmm. champions, would be willing to work with a new calendar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. versus no, we wouldn't which would then <laughs> make everyone's life more difficult, yeah. but that that would be something they would be willing to work with. Yeah, and we already have reached out oh. to them, um, so okay. we'll gather some additional information now that we have even more specifics, just to ensure that that support would continue to be there for our families to, to the best that we can support that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll touch on something briefly that nobody did. After thanking uh, Jane and Justin for a very thought out, very thorough presentation. Nice job. Um, I agree with, with many of the comments and, and in general regarding professional development, I'm completely on board with figuring out what, how we can make that happen. Uh, and I trust that the administration and you're doing a really good job working with the teachers to figure out uh, the best way to make that happen. So. Um, when you come back with the questions, uh, I'll be with the answers to the questions the board brought. I'm sure I'll be supportive of the outcome that you, or the conclusion that you come to. Uh, but the topic that had, nobody has talked about that I'm, I'm very happy to see is the curriculum coordinator. Uh, one of the many, uh, or the top concern of many groups, when we talk about uh, principals, we talk about um, teachers, we talk about parents, is the new curriculums that are coming and the burden that puts on our professional staff. Uh, the comments, by and large, are very, very positive for Mr. Sissel and all of his work. However, a consistent comment is that he can't do it all, uh, that he needs help yesterday. Uh, <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, so thank you for all your work, and I fully support adding uh, extra help regarding curriculum, and I think it's a wonderful idea to, to have a half assistant principal uh -huh. and a half curriculum coordinator. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, with that, we will, given the time, before we go to reception of visitors, we will take a five-minute recess. Thank you. go to the reception of visitors. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board subject to reasonable constraints, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. The criticism of individuals is not in order. In accordance with board policies 8022 and 1150, individuals appearing before the board are expected to follow the following guidelines. 
One, any person addressing the board shall identify yourself, state your school attendance area, and shall speak as briefly as possible. Two, the board president has authority to determine procedural matters regarding public participation, not otherwise a board policy, including time limitations when appropriate. And three, the president is responsible for the orderly conduct of the meeting and shall rule on such matters as the time allowed for public discussion and the appropriateness of their remarks to the subject under consideration. Uh, please remember we allow three minutes per comment and we'll allow 30 minutes total uh, if necessary. Uh, at this time, we will look at the cards. And we have no cards, so then we will open it up to uh, anyone else who would like to speak. You can come to the podium, state your name, attendance area, and provide your public comment. <laughs> You're welcome. So, I'm um, Carrie Blanagan. I'm a parent at Bel Air. And I'm just going to go back to like in probably two hours ago now um, when we were talking about the middle school model moving the sixth to eighth. And I've heard it a lot. People are really concerned about moving the sixth graders with the eighth graders. And oh my gosh, we'll have sixth graders with eighth graders. I have not heard anyone say anything about my second graders being with sixth graders. My second graders class in an open concept school is plopped right in the middle of a sixth grade class and a fifth grade class on either side, diagonally a fourth grade class and another, uh, how are we, another fifth grade class. Um, and it's not a complaint, it's just that's what it is. It is what it is. So we have no issues with our kindergartners or first year or second graders and we take all this pride in bringing them together and if, if, uh, doing families or buddies um, and it's totally cool that they're all that way. And I mean yes they're younger kids and kids are kids but there's a difference between a first grader and a fifth grader and a sixth grader and as they get up each year you know they learn a little more and are bringing home some neat new tidbits. Um, <laughs> so it's just <laughs> something to keep in mind and additionally it's a middle school model and if you look around to all the middle school models in their surrounding districts they're six through eight and we're doing such a great job with the strategic planning to looking to other districts we just talked about for an hour about how they do the, the reduced days or the late starts or how they do their teacher training. So let's look to the other districts for this. There's always going to be someone that has an issue, I understand, but that's just kind of my two cents. So that's that. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Um, Next one would be the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the January 14th, 2019 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the January 14th, 2019 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the January 16th, 2019 special meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the January 16th, 2019 special meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the February 4th, 2019 special meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of February 4th, 2019 special meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the November 28th, 2018 and January 24th, 2019 board tour uh, and PTA meetings as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the November 28th, 2018 and January 24th. 2019 board tour and PTA meetings as presented. Next is the approval of this consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet materials? So moved. Second. Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Miller. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. 
Uh, the motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet materials. Next is uh, rec items for recommendation for action. Uh, first is 2019-20 school fees as recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to approve student fees for 2019-20 as follows? Instructional materials grades one through eight at $202 per year. Kindergarten at $123 per year. Um, milk for kindergarten through sixth grade, $29. Uh, outdoor education at $184, middle school novel at $10, middle school yearbook at $20, <coughs> transportation less than 1.5 mile or greater than 1.5 miles, sorry, $35, mm -hmm. transportation less than 1.5 miles, $504, uh, operational kindergarten enrichment and enhancement program at $2,550. And the preschool tuition program, the application fee at $50 and the annual fee at $3,750. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Quick question, if you don't know the answer, this is just to get back to me. How do we collect the transportation fee from non-58 uh, students? Uh, typically, it's via a check. So the 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 schools we provide transportation for collect it and or they bring it, it to, us? to or they bring it into the district office it's it for those the parochial are schools no those mean? are not for parochial schools yeah. those are for you're saying for the students who are less than 1.5 miles or no. for any of the busing fees so oh. we charge everybody in district 58 for a bus but we provide students in that don't the, attend 58 schools sorry, busing how do we collect those Thank fees you. the parochial students yeah, we they the school we get a check from them in, through, through the school okay so we don't have to collect it individually yeah. the school collects it and, okay Thank you. And, Thank you, again, i hate these fees but I, it's the reality of how we have to fund things so i don't i know none of us like them any further discussion Okay, Melissa, please call roll. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Miller. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. The motion carried to approve student fees for 2019 and 20 as presented. Uh, next is the science curriculum adoption TCI as recommended by the STEM committee. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of TCI bringing science alive? in the quantities defined in the attached quote for a total cost of $373,087.50. So moved. Second. Any discussion? My assumption is since nobody spoke against this, there's consensus that this is the right thing to do. <laughs> I mean, I've sat here for nine years and we've had the same discussion and two years later, everybody says, I didn't want to do this. We, we actually had a pretty thorough discussion around around what consensus looks like and we and, and I and I think and I think and truly not I've got not, hammered for saying I voted because committee said it and committee said this so. well and actually we were we were clear too that the committee makes the recommendation to the administration the the, the, the recommendation is ultimately coming from me and and I'll, I'll own that piece of it for sure I think we, we spent a, a good number of hours talking through the resources that were there talking through what what they would mean for us now and in the future I think the committee is excited about the fact that you know this is a six-year purchase so that means that theoretically if, if if something newer and stronger were to come out we could reconvene and look at that that's part of our ongoing review but with that with that caveat and and with the understanding that this is something that we want to implement fully and with fidelity the committee uh, landed in a pretty excited place I'm excited I've always thought I, I'm this is one where I thought there would have been more uproar. I can't believe where we spent all the time we did on math. This is the one that I thought was the biggest weakness all along. So I, I, I just, lack of hearing anybody complain about it, I'm making myself a note on February 11th <laughs> that there was no discussion against this. And trust me, I will be out in that audience the next time I will hear you? somebody complain about curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also just like to uh, thank you and, and the all the committees uh, for all their hard work. This has been a really long time coming. Yeah. Really long and if time. I think back to the earliest conversations that uh, took place when I was on the board, the ones that stuck out you know, seven years ago mm -hmm. uh, was around science. Mm -hmm. 
and when are we going to be able to get that together? And mm -hmm. this has just been been such a long time. So um, I'm very happy about this motion. Thank you. Um, okay. Any further discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Miller. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of TCI, bringing science alive in the quantities defined, and the attached quote for a total cost of three hundred seventy-three thousand eighty-seven dollars and fifty cents. Next is a second reading of internal board operations. Sorry, there's oh, a second. second. Nope. Skip, there's another science. Science. Skip a little bit. So that's half of our science curriculum. There should be another science curriculum on your screen. And that's surplus. Yes, yeah, surplus. I think we're missing. But the motion is right. Okay. Uh, next, is there a motion to approve the purchase of Activate Learning IQWST in the quantities defined in the attached quote for a total cost of $407,315? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Miller. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. Motion carried to approve the purchase of Activate Learning iQuest in the quantities defined in the attached quote for a total cost of $407,315. Uh, next is a second reading of internal board operations. Is there a motion to adopt? Mm -hmm. Sorry, this is there's still another one before ID. that. ID. ID. Surplus equipment. Surplus. You must have deleted a whole section. We didn't get enough snow this year, so we're getting rid of some stuff. I guess. Maybe the meeting has gone too long. So. <laughs> the words are disappearing off of my sheets. Disappearing off of my, off of my sheets. Uh, okay, is there a motion uh, to designate the following as surplus equipment? Toro Power Shift 824 two stage snowblower. Toro 624 two stage snowblower. Toro Proline 36 inch lawnmower, a large safe, <laughs> and a pneumatic floor machine. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Miller. Aye. Member Samantha. Aye. Member Siegel. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Member Purcell. Aye. The motion carried. No, oh, see, I already was trying to, to <laughs> jump forward. Or there. Designate the following as surplus equipment. Toro Power Shift 824 two-stage snowblower, Toro 624 two-stage snowblower, Toro's Proline 36-inch lawnmower, a large safe, and a pneumatic floor machine. I thought you were going to start singing. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky for you, I didn't. <laughs> Uh, can we finally go yes. to my second yes. reading of the internal <laughs> board operations? Let's do it. We're waiting for three hours and 15 minutes for this one. Uh, <laughs> next, a second reading of internal board operations policies 8021, 8022, 8100, 8102, 8130, and 8140, as recommended by the policy committee. Is there a motion to adopt revisions to internal board operations? Policies 8021, Code of Conduct, 8022, Meetings, 8100, Membership and Terms of Office, 8102, Vacancy on the School Board, 8130, Board Member Development, and 8140, Membership in School Board Associations. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carried to adopt revisions to policies 8021, 8022, 8100, 8102, 8130, and 8140. Next is a second reading for deletion, internal board operations policy 8023 as recommended by the policy committee. Is there a motion to delete as duplicative policy 8023, abused and neglected child reporting? So moved. Second. Any discussion? 
I just like that we add the duplicative part in there. Because <laughs> we deleted we deleted policies before, but we probably should say this is duplicative. That's how we're getting rid of our <laughs> abused and neglected <laughs> policy. Yeah, it does help with clear. It does help. This Cut. one this one in particular we were yes. sensitive to right. making that note um, because it it is covered well in the other policies. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carried to delete as duplicative <laughs> policy number 8023. Uh, next is a few announcements um, for some dates. The policy committee meets Tuesday, February 19th at 7 a.m. at the ASC. The Board of Education building tour and PTA meeting is Tuesday, February 19th at 6 p.m. at Henry Puffer. The district leadership team uh, will meet Monday, February 25th at 3.45 at Longfellow. Uh, to Fairmont. Fairmount. District leadership team Monday, February 25th, 3.45 at Fairmount. Uh, there will be a staff meet and greet with the Board of Education Monday, February 25th at 6.30 at Fairmount. Uh, the next curriculum workshop is the 25th, Monday the 25th at 7 p.m. at Fairmount following that meet and greet. And now the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to meet in closed session to discuss the appointment, <coughs> employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district, collective negotiating matters between the district and its employees or their representatives, or deliberation concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees, and or discussion of minutes of the of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval by the body of the minutes or the Sunday annual review of the minutes as mandated by Section 206. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Melissa?